Uh, my colleague Sharon Stetson uh, is on the chat. So as we walk around, uh, if you have any questions, uh, she may be able to answer those questions directly in the chat. Um, she can also kick questions out to um, our roving team with the camera here. Uh, and today that is uh, myself uh, and my colleague, Kristen Odell. Uh, Kristen will also be giving a presentation as she did yesterday uh, in the gallery. Uh, she is the store and gallery manager. Uh, she's also the host of In the Making. Um, as we uh, get started with cabinet and furniture in a few minutes, uh, we'll be with uh, a student, Colin Schmidt, uh, who will be our tour guide. And in a moment, I'm gonna introduce you uh, to our provost, Claire Fruitman. Uh, she is a graduate of cabinet and furniture making, also a former instructor. Uh, and now she's our provost of all of the uh, full-time accredited career training programs here at North Bennett Street School. And then just while we're waiting for uh, everyone to log on here this morning, uh, I'm gonna take a cue from my colleague, Colleen Walsh Powell, who's the director of development. Yesterday, she just asked everyone if they could just chime in on the chat and just say uh, where you're from, either uh, you know where you are geographically or what school or organization uh, you might be with. Uh, and that'll give us an idea of who you are um, as an audience. So I hope that that's helpful. And uh, great, I see Marilyn, Arlington, Mass, Framingham, Long Island, Virginia, Dubrovnik, New Orleans. That's great, thanks everybody. And keep those things coming uh, throughout. And like I said, in that chat function, uh, you'll be able to ask questions and uh, Sharon and admissions um, will we'll answer those. We've got one more day tomorrow. Uh, that's day three. We'll be visiting jewelry making and repair, violin making and repair. Uh, and also the carpentry program. Later on today, there's two continuing ed uh, classes that are free. Uh, two o'clock is Renee Kelsey. Uh, she's gonna go over a piano technician's toolkit. Uh, and we also uh, have Eli Cleveland, uh, who will be uh, giving us a demonstration of SketchUp. Uh, Eli is a graduate of cabinet and furniture making. Uh, and he also uh, is an instructor in continuing education. Uh, Renee Kelsey uh, is a graduate of basic and advanced piano technology, uh, and she has hosted this uh, tool class once before, uh, so we've asked her to do it today uh, to share with you. Uh, we love tools here at North Bend Street School, and um, welcome everyone from wherever you are. Uh, we're excited again to be able to share what we offer here at North Bend Street School. I'm gonna just switch my camera here and introduce you uh, to our provost, Claire Fruitman. Just a sec here. There we go. Hi, Claire, good morning. Good morning. Welcome everybody. So excited to have you here at North Bennett Street School this morning. As Rob said, I'm Claire Fruitman, I'm the provost. I oversee the academic programs but I'm also a graduate and a former instructor in the cabinet and furniture making program, which is the first program you're going to see today. Feel free to come and go today as you please if something interests you. Or stay all day. There's a lot to see. As Rob said, we're going to see cabinet furniture making, basic piano technology, and advanced piano technology. And then sprinkled throughout the day, there's going to be a show and tell at the store. There's going to be an info session at noontime. And there will be two classes that Rob just mentioned toward the end of the day. So we hope you enjoy it. We're really excited to be able to show off the school even though we can't have guests in person. Enjoy your day. And I'm gonna turn you back over to Rob, Kristen and Colin to go see cabinet and furniture making. Great, thank you, Claire. All right. And here we have uh, Colin Schmidt and Kristen Odell. Hey everyone. Hi. Hi. So everybody, welcome to Cabinet and Furniture. We're happy to kick off the day and we're excited everyone was able to join us here. Right now we're standing right outside of our shop space. 
This is the staging area for a lot of students finished projects where once finished, one of our instructors, Lance Patterson, does a great job photographing and cataloging, cataloging the pieces. That way you can put them in a portfolio, use them for years down the road. While we're here, this is a great introduction. Whenever you walk in the space, it's an exciting way to be inspired, to get excited about the things that you eventually will make here at Cabinet and Furniture at North Bennett Street. For the very first semester students, they want to start you with the fundamentals. They want to make sure you understand the basics, sharpening tools, drafting, the concepts of the joinery and the furniture that you'll soon be making. We don't have any first semesters up here with us today. As we go in to the shop space, we're going to get started with second semesters and see the projects that they typically work on and are all engaged in right now. So with that, Let's head into the shop space and meet our first instructor. And just to share with everybody who's at home, uh, cabinet and furniture making uh, is one of the programs here that's over 100 years old in some form or another. It is an 18 month program that has two starts uh, a year that uh, those starts are every fall and every spring uh, in February and September. Wonderful, thank you, Rob. The first instructor we're going to meet today is Matt Weta. Matt is currently instructing our second semester students, guiding them through their first two projects. Matt, how long have you been with the school? Well, this is my third year with Cabinet Furniture and my 20th year with the school. A graduate of this very program. What things do you typically teach, Matt? We are well, typically this area would be our beginner area or our starting area, our fundamentals area, but that's in the basement now. So we are finishing up nightstands. This one is its last element is the knob, but it's our, one of our ones that came out of this group. Um, we're also finishing toolboxes. This is a third slash fourth semester project, um, or I should say the student is a third or fourth semester student. Um, this was made pre-COVID and with our uh, our proficiency test as well. So this is set up for review by the other three instructors, and then we'll have a special Zoom meeting for everyone to go over the work. And thinking about those two projects, Matt, what are the things that we're wanting students to get out of these first two projects in the I think this project, the nightstand project to me, represents kind of all of the joinery samples that we've done up to this point. So it has mortise and tenons for the side aprons, carefully dovetailed together nicely so this is that half lap sample the true sample tell me what kind of wood this is this is so walnut useful. this is wow. walnut and it's an interesting piece it's uh it has i would say mostly sap wood but in a way that's really really beautiful to look at yeah i've never so. seen walnut like this and the top shares a little bit of that action as well we'll put it down so you guys can see it a little bit of that softness to it also. Yeah, so light. That's very nice. So twin tenons to below, dovetailed partition above. And to me, this is kind of the, this is the proving ground to see if all of those samples worked out. And it's also the first project that you are drafting and building uh, start to finish. Mm -hmm. and it's a poplar frame and then a primary top and drawer front. Mm -hmm. And the toolbox to me, that represents more of a, it's seemingly like our, it's one of our pinnacle projects. It's been part of the program since the beginning, since Phil Bo's time. Uh, and it is the beginnings of, I think, feeling confident about this, these exercises, move through a little bit more independently. And at the same time, it represents uh, traditional case construction. Mm -hmm. I also love that the, this is always an opportunity for students to, do you, you know some experimental yes so we we have some parameters for the toolboxes as far as size uh woods that we'd like you to use it's all based on student success and keeping it within our three month time frame uh the door panels are where we kind of let everyone do their thing and uh be a little bit more creative mm -hmm. same thing with some of the drawer organization as well and this panel's really really cool so i like the asymmetry of it and I like the inlaid uh, yeah. scutcheon for the key. Yeah. Right. And do you still have your toolbox, Matt? I do, yep. Use it every day. Or I should say I used to use it every day. 
Do you is yours what you use yours, right? Yeah, absolutely. I love yours you'll too. you'll see several student toolboxes as we work through here, not just completed, but quite a few in progress. Yes. So mm -hmm. my group, there are two or three that are in progress. Uh, shaker nightstands that are getting finished up, and everyone is excited to go around the corner and join Dan in third semester. Great. Wonderful. Awesome. Thank you very much, Matt. Thank you guys so Thanks, much. Matt. Welcome. Thanks, Matt. As we work through the first area in the shop, we're going to see second semester students. We're going to see some drafting, some toolbox construction, nightstands being worked on. All things that some are carrying over from that first semester, some will lead into the third semester. Hi, everyone. How's it going? Going great. Hey, hey, how's it going? Good. Got a question. What size are the drafting boards? Oh. We have a few different sizes. Uh, the full scale ones are 72 by 48. There you go. Is that exact? Hey, speak with authority, people will believe you. <laughs> no, there's different sizes. And as we get down here, we meet our first <laughs> our first Hi. student Hi. demo. This is Canyon. Hey Canyon. Canyon is gonna teach us a little bit about dovetails. Awesome. Yes. Um so I'm Canyon. Um, I'm a second semester here at Mac Bennett. Um and dovetails are a mechanical way to join two pieces of wood together at a right angle. Um, Kristen, can you give me a drawer? Yeah, sure can. So if you don't know what dovetails are, this is what they look like. Um, these are the tails and these are the pins. Um, if you want the tails on the side that, you know, wherever the force is going to be applied on the joint, so this is a drawer, it's gonna be pulled this way. So the friction or, you know, every, the joint holding it together goes that way. Um, if it were hanging, you would want it this way. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm gonna show you how to make these. Cool. Um, so you start with your layout for the pins. Um, you can do tails or pins first, although here at North Bennett, um, we prefer to do pens first, it's how it's taught. Um, so first you need a shoulder line. Uh, for that, you use a marking gauge mm. and um, you take the thickness of your, well, really either one of the boards, if they're the same, um, and you go just a hair over and then you, um, Describe along the ends to give you a shoulder. Now for the pins, you want it just on the face, either face, um, and not on the edges. Um, for the tails, you want it all the way around. Uh, the pins, um, this edge is going to extend all the way through, so you don't want to end up with a line. Like I say, I wouldn't want a line, um, well, Never mind. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I'll show you how to lay out the pins. Um, I have a question while you're, while you're, because uh, let me shout out a question to yes. us while you're working this out. Um, and this might be a question for Dan to answer, unless one of you mm -hmm. feel like taking a stab at this. Um, interested in Danish and Japanese woodworking design, would somebody be able to, would I be able to explore these styles for any projects as a member of this program? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's, there's no restrictions as to the styles that you explore in your time here and the styles that you research. Um, every instructor is going to have their area of expertise or the things that they will be able to best help you with, but we're certainly not going to deter anyone or uh, discourage anyone from trying anything out in their time period. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna add to that. I wanna say Josh Viegas was a student from a few years ago and he went and he went and uh, did an internship in Japan and he was very interested in Japanese woodworking and really has combined a lot of what he learned at North Bennett Street School 
with the work that he does now. Mm -hmm. yeah. But one of the things that is, you know, you, you learn outside of those techniques that you might want to explore on your own, dovetailing what you're working on canyon is the basics of all of those things. So oh, yeah. that's Absolutely. what you're learning too. Yeah. So to lay out the pins, um, first you need to pick uh, a width for your pins. Um, and you lay that out on either edge of your pin board. Um, I like half an inch. Um, it's just, I mean, it's a number that works, honestly. Um, you could do how big could you go? For pins, I mean, God, I don't really know. I mean, the pins are always smaller than the tails. I know the tails you never want more than like two inches mm -hmm. just because you know the wood you could expand this way and you don't want it to put stress on the joint and pop it open and you know, cause cracking or whatever. But half inch is your... But I like half an inch. Yeah. Um, that's what I did on these. Um, that's what I typically do. Um, so you would lay out a half inch mark, which I've already done just on either edge. And that's going to be our first in, at least the first step in the layout. And then what you actually want to do is um, cut that in half. And then, um, so if I half inch, so I would go like a quarter of an inch on either side, just cutting the pins that I've already laid out in half and then extend a line, the length of the board, um, just an arbitrary amount, like six inches, eight inches, whatever. Um, and we're gonna use that and this ruler to give us our the location for the rest of our pins in the middle. Mm. Um, so let's say I want say one is total of five pins. Um, I would take the ruler and then I would take um, like put it. On one end, like say the end of this line or anywhere on this line, you would um, zero it out. I mean, just say like this is our one. And then we want to go to whatever, you can use any number that's divisible by the number of pins you want to place on the board. So if we're doing five, I want to use say 10. Um, so. So the width of this board is not what ultimately determines how many dovetails you end up having? No, it's it's not. It can be really whatever you want, wow. honestly. Um, the tails did end up having. I also never knew you all pulled the blade out of the combination square. So oh. pretty cool. Yeah, I'm yeah always all really the time. delicate Very about often. it. Um, <laughs> I guess that's what makes a good one is you can put it back in easily, right? You can tell how skilled somebody is, how quickly they can return the blade. To the combination <laughs> oh yeah, square. that's always such a pain. Okay, <laughs> so I have this all laid out and now, of course, now that I'm on the spot, I can't remember. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Um, well, it looks like that's the same layout to that other board you have. No, it's not. I laid this one out differently. So. We could jump to this one, and if you could show us what, you know, the, the, the cutout okay, process Okay, so, is. you know, I'm on the spot, and I can't remember how to do this thing. I do That's remember. all good. <laughs> okay, um, so we'll just move on to cutting the pens. Um, so we have our, our layout. Um, and I like to use a Japanese saw. Typically, we use European saws at this school, but I started with traditional boat building, and that's just what they use. So that's what I'm accustomed to. What's the difference? Um, this cuts on the pole, mm -hmm. um, and they're also more affordable for me. So <laughs> that's a plus. Um, so we have our layout, we have our waist marked. Um, 
for the pins, we want to go ahead and cut out where the tails are going to go. Um, so you want to cut on the side of the line wherever your waist is marked for the X's. Mm -hmm. so, so not on the other side of the line? No, not on the other side of the line. What, like a millimeter or something? What's the loss? Um, for, the, for the curve? Uh, for the wood, how much wood do you lose when you're, you know, when you're sawing, when you're cutting? Um, well, it's going to be however wide the blade right, is. That is yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, now, ideally, you want to cut right next to the line, almost splitting it if you can do that. It's very, very difficult. Um, yeah. It saves you a lot of time, but I mean, and that's always what you aim for. So, um, and then you want to like peek around and just make sure you're not going to cut through your shoulder line um, and the closer you get, the more careful and slowly you need to go. Um, some people just kind of know when to stop, but I'm very, very cautious. You can always chip that out later, right? Yes, yes, you okay. can. Um, but I like to just kind of barely kiss the shoulder. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right about there. And that's also because once you remove it, you can't put it back. No, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and that's like, I don't know, one of the most important things to like learn about woodworking in general. It's just, okay, this is 100% about being careful. <laughs> like, right, you think about what you're, now, you're about to do. Um, okay, so from here, you would go on and start chopping um, our waist out. Um, we already have a pen pre-cut for this. So. How many dovetails do you, th I mean, hypothetically, I know you couldn't come up with a number, but how many dovetails are you cutting out before you get one spot on? Um, I think everybody's different, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Take, it's, it's going to vary. The, the, I think the nicest set I ever cut was my very first set, and it's been all downhill from there. I don't have a chisel out. Let me grab a chisel. I'm, gonna, I'm right in your way. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I'll use this. I also love that you're using um, Mass Woodworks marking gauge, which right. I'm going to talk about in the store. A little bit later. Yeah. Oh, Students yeah. also make their own marking gauges uh, yeah. as part of first semester. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so uh, really the most important thing to take away when you start chopping is again, just like sawing, um, you want to save the shoulder. Like that's that's what's going to give you a crisp joint without any light coming through any big gaps. It makes it pretty basically. Mm -hmm. um, so the trick to that is you want to start just a little bit away from your shoulder line with the flat towards the shoulder. Um, I guess I'll use this one. Um, is this the mallet that you made? Yes, this is the mallet that we turn here at school. Um, it's kind of subjective how it comes out, um, but that's kind of the general design. Yeah. Um, I turned this one a long time ago and it's my preferred mallet. <laughs> <laughs> it's made of black locust and it's never gonna break. So nice. It's like a judge's mallet. Right, yeah. Yeah. Canyon, um, we have a question just before you get started. Uh, someone uh, in the, our audience wanted to just know what's the difference between the pin and the tail. 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 Oh, yeah, that's important. Okay, so the tails. Um, well, they look like this, and I guess that's why they're called dovetails. Okay. Um, and the pins, um, 
I guess they're similar. I guess I'll just show it here. So these are a set of completed pens. Okay. And then these are a set of completed tails. Mm -hmm. um, and the pins hold the tails in place, just like that. So if you pull down, it's not ever going to go anywhere. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so it yeah. seems simple, but it's yeah. also <laughs> uh, pretty complicated <laughs> and, and very strong. Yeah. Yes. Um, and you'll cut hundreds in your time. Oh, yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> you'll never, ever. And precision is, is clutch here, right? I mean, that's what makes it pretty and stable is right. all of that precision. Okay. So, um, shopping. So again, you want to get a little bit away from the line because the chisel is a wedge shape. Whenever you hammer down onto the, the butt of the chisel, um, the wedge will force the fibers back. And if you're right next to your shoulder when you have all this material around the wedge, um, you're just gonna end up burning your shoulder line. So you start, I mean, I've heard a 16th, I've heard an eighth. Um, wood species might also kind of matter. Some are a little more compressible than others, like the fibers. Uh, poplar is pretty soft, so it's probably, you know, Kind of a good idea to give it a little more space, mm -hmm. and then you just chop, and then go across. Okay, and then actually, And then just to keep that nice crisp shoulder. Um, so that's all then chiseled out. There's no saw that goes inside of that. Uh, Depending on your method. Depending some on your method. Some people saw it the way some people chop. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, and now we have a nice crisp shoulder. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Canyon, yes. thank you very, very much. Uh, we're so grateful. Um, no, you are so great. No, no. Um, awesome. We are going to keep moving on through okay. the shop. Um, Canyon, uh, as they mentioned, uh, was a boat builder. Uh, and I'll also share uh, that Canyon is a U.S. Navy veteran uh, as well. So, right. and do you have a, like an Instagram or anything like that where oh. people could see more of your work? Um, yes, uh, my Instagram name is Roaming Forests. Okay. Um, there's some woodworking content on there. <laughs> Very cool. Thank you, Canyon. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, all right. Where are we going next, Colin? So as we move on, we're going to start to progress past second semester into the third semester space. Here you're going to see toolboxes very far along in construction or done. Also, you're going to start to see other projects. A third semester is when a student is going to do things like start their first chair, their first table piece, both graduation requirements. To talk a little bit more about both those pieces, we have the head of the department right here, Dan Faya. Hey, Dan. Hey, how are you? Hey, Dan. Hey, Rob. Wow, hi. Welcome. Thank you. How's the so far? Wonderful. Fun. Pretty good. good. Yeah, <laughs> seeing a lot of good stuff. Yeah. What I thought I would show you, and if you have any questions, fire away. Um, I've been working with third semester students typically. Uh, when I'm here, I'm the department head of the program. Um, I oversee uh, all the semesters, all the projects that help within any semester. Uh, but right now we're focused on um, having our own pods as you've already seen. But the group that we just worked with, um, we did a table as a workshop. Tables are one of the requirements. Um, and typically a table project 
for us, um, uh, first time out of the game, something fairly quick, a new type of construction. You've seen the shaker knife stand. Um, so this takes that to another level. This is a splay leg table, so compound angle joinery. Um, they had some options within that. Uh, you'll meet Lance later on, one of our other instructors, our senior instructor, but he turned some different legs. You can see some different legs we have here. Um, I wanted to check those out. Uh, so as you go around, you'll see some of these tables. Um, I'm actually Mark's doing one right there, finishing up his. But the idea was to go through something fairly quickly as a group, um, uh, try to get some new joinery, some new uh, machinery techniques, and some new construction techniques, and try to get it done in a, in a quick amount of time. Um, the model one that Lance and I came up with was based off the Shaker design that we saw in a magazine. Kind of liked it, uh, liked the size, keeping it small, but it has a um, mortise and tenon uh, joinery for the base. There's a batten. This batten helps keep the tabletop flat. That batten fits inside of a housing, gets screwed to the tabletop, uh, cross ran on the tabletop like this. So actually this table, even though it's a pretty traditional table, has a modern look to it, just because of the design of the legs, and this is the legs, and then the use of a, a not very selective piece of walnut that we would typically use. We typically want just the hardwood and not so much sapwood in our furniture, traditional furniture, but I use it as an accent here to kind of make it look. I, I've i never seen walnut with the sapwood in the feet. I've never seen this before. Well, it doesn't work in the middle, right? So basically this was one board and it got cut and it had a slip match and we put it together. Oh, so yeah. typically sapwood would be on the outside. Got it. It doesn't happen on the inside. <laughs> I also love the feet. I was just telling Kellen, uh, Ke uh, Colin, sorry, Kellen, um, the, the splay legs, yep. I've never seen that here. It's so cool. Yeah, and also it's going to get a paint on it, probably some kind of a red paint is what I'm thinking right now. This mm -hmm. is a little tunnel, but we'll see how it goes. I'm sanding the base now, getting it complete. But um, also this group will be folding into a chair workshop. We definitely do that as a, as a class. This is the chair I just wrapped up in the end of October with the last chair group. Um, it's a walnut chair. It's got ash uh, veneer on the back. And it's got traditional horsehair upholstery that Lance teaches as part of our curriculum as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's it goes in the same line as many of the other projects. The shaker nightstand is an introduction to table construction. The toolbox is an introduction to casework, traditional casework. This is an introduction to chair building, and this is starting to build on the kind of other uh, types of uh, uh, table constructions with the split leg. Or you'll see tripod tables. You probably saw some in the foyer. There's some other ones going on. Yeah. Um, and some other things as well. But this chair that you see, it, we call it the modern chair. It's one of the designed to keep it kind of straightforward. But it is a traditional Queen Anne chair. Same build, same angles. It's just how you shape the wood. Joiner mm -hmm. is the same. Dan, I got a question uh, from someone in our audience, and their question is about what kind of career opportunities are there um, coming out of this program? So a lot of folks, they have the aspiration to have their own shops. Um, the reality of it is that there's a lot of cabinet shops, mill workshops, larger furniture shops um, that are doing more production line work. That tends to be where people will head out uh, to start out, restoration, conservation, um, while they're getting their own uh, shop rolling. There's, there's, there are some, but not a lot of custom furniture shops out there hiring graduates as far as uh, building exactly what we're building, but what we're teaching is a high level of construction and a high level of workmanship that will transfer to those other things. So we have folks in conservation field, we have folks in both building fields, we have folks in a lot of different millwork uh, type of things. So the skills are transferable, but I think everybody's ultimate goal once they've got their self established and got in the workforce and learning a little bit about the business is to have their own shop. So there are co-op shops out there that are sharing that type of responsibility to people that want to take the plunge right away. So. That's great. Uh, I, I also think uh, in education as well, uh, there's people that are instructors. I know we have uh, uh, Aspen is down at Penland. Yep. Um, uh, Brennan is at Belmont Hills. Yep. Uh, so there's a number of, of people that are that are teaching also. Uh, also, while you're here, if you wanted to see really quick, you'll see some of these monitors that are kicking around the shop too, just uh, some of the technology that we're using. So I have my laptop here. We record all the demos that we do. So we can basically get in here, we record, we can play, we can live stream within the shop. So it's a way for us to be socially distanced, use technology to our advantage, but they're, they're notes. Uh, so if people are out in this time, anything like that, we have this 
All right, that's great. And I know uh, um, uh, the sound uh, might be a little tricky up here, um, uh, but uh, Dan just talked about how uh, technology uh, is really, um, I think, at the heart and really growing uh, up here in all of the full-time programs. Yes, they are. Dan, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate it. Dan's also a graduate uh, of the program, and you went to Swampskit High School. And uh, was it your woodshop teacher there that told you about North Bend Street School? Mr. Butler. That's great. The one that got me here. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. I just had to point out, Colin just told me this is the most uncomfortable chair ever. I've sat in it. I think Colin said it's because it's a shop chair. It's not supposed to be comfortable. That's right. There you go. Yeah, it's supposed to be working in the shop. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. As we move on, we're going to be seeing still more third semester students working on those tables, working on the school boxes. But we're also going to progress over time into fourth semester. It's at this stage you're going to start to see a lot of customization. People bringing their own ideas and flair and personality into their pieces. It's really exciting to be peeking over shoulders when you start rounding this corner. A lot of uniqueness, a lot of individual pieces. A couple of great in progress tool boxes right here. Mm -hmm. Oh, this case is wet and malleable. Interesting. Right here we have Keelan practicing some rush on a footstool. Hey, Keelan. It's important that you keep asking him questions and distracting him. Oh, good. <laughs> Does What's that cardboard your... stay inside of there then? Yes. Uh, you can do about two to three layers of it just to make sure that the rush stays firm mm -hmm. and nice, and eventually it'll dry along with it. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Oh. Wow. Some inlay prepping. <laughs> Here we have Joey uh, prepping his play leg table. We just learned a little bit about, and we can see the dramatic difference here versus the one Dan had, for an example. A lot of really great detail on this piece. Tell me what this technique is called again. This is a stringing and bell power. Mm -hmm. And you use holly for the stringing. Uh, typically, I'm actually using. Um, uh, seat caning that we cut real thin, so it's a lot cheaper and basically it's the same thing, but that way you can get the cheap cost down. Yeah, <laughs> great. Stunning. Thank you. Stunning. Thank and you. for everybody that's just joining us, we are in the cabinet and furniture making uh, program at North Bennett Street School, an 18 month uh, uh, full time program. <laughs> what is that for? Draw uh, this is for my display light. Display light? Yep. Nice. We're now starting to progress into the fourth semester. Here you're seeing case pieces, wrapping up those graduation requirements, as well as if people have time afterwards, they might go on and make extra pieces, make various samples of things they don't wanna uh, make a whole piece to encompass. Techniques they wanna make sure they get while they still have the instruction and time here. Hey, Right, right here is a wonderful example. Even after you're done drafting in your first and second semesters, that drafting doesn't go away. Every time you make a piece here at North Bennett, you will draft it. This is a good example of a beautiful full-size draft that is slowly turning into the piece right in front of it. It's a Hepple White style dressing room. I love that. Beautiful. So this will be. Then it'll get veneer on it, and uh, we cut these little strips of veneer, and uh, things are going to be like that. And it'll go on the outside of there. Beautiful. Yeah, on the outside. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Good job. Yes. 
so as we get around the end, we have our second demo. Avram is going to teach us a little bit about Windsor technology and give us a steam bending demo. Hello. Uh, yeah, uh, Hello. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Hello, everybody. How's it going? Good. So I'll talk about Windsor chairs a little bit. Uh, they're a little different than most things we build here because they're not made from square stock. They don't come from the lumber yard typically. It's coming from a tree arrived out of a piece of wood like this. So all these spindles are broken down from a piece of oak. Square, we split them out with a the crow. Then we'll drive them into octagon. Wow. I'll show you how we split them. We'll try to. Got a crow. And so then you have a big piece of square stock, square fish. You might write it down a little more, but you go to your tape boards. Get it drawn up. Oh, don't. Well, typically, you make it a little nice before you start. <laughs> <laughs> so, once you get square, I'm just going to show people the, the foot brake on here uh, to get the tension. Yep, so it's, it's, you're your own plan. Mm -hmm. As you push, you can't yeah. pull it back. Very different than what we normally work on the bench. So you're going to Things be pretty quick. Nick would be more accurate. I was going to ask, at what, at what point do you want to be most efficient when you break it down there? Yeah, I mean, if you can save time there, you save time here. Yeah. If you can, sometimes you have to saw it out because the wood is uncooperative. Mm -hmm. Some of this wood had to be sawed out. Uh, but the thing that's attractive about it, so that you can just find a log and split it. Yeah. And it's pretty big. I mean, you don't need a big workshop. You can just you know, buy some hand tools and do it. Anyway, mm -hmm. so here we go. We've got. So now we're going to snow <coughs> bend the wood. Yeah. So, so plug the bait and fill. I've rise and squared up this piece, which is going to be an arm bow. And then in 45 minutes to an hour. This hour? Hey, yeah. magic. Pretty quick, 45 minutes. Yeah. Then we're going to go up here. Better to have Winding it up. Maybe calm.
unbelievable. Kind of unfortunate. Not there, but in a few days, maybe a week, put in the calendar because it happened quicker. It'll release tension. It'll actually continue to bend and be tighter than I can be. Mm -hmm. so, and that's the arm bow we're making. That chair is. Is this your your these markers? That's, that's Collins. Maybe we can see what that ends up on this. Sure. Way. That is amazing. And this, so this is a sack back lenser. It's a similar, same process. Mm -hmm. Comb back. Beautiful wrapper right there. And uh, they can be pretty quick. Amazing. Abram, that's great. Are these all your chairs? These, yep. This is the first one I made with Peter Calvert, which is a typical workshop that they run here in February, January, maybe. This year, I don't think it's happening. He's a great chair maker. He runs classes. I think he's doing a lot of online content now. So. Nice. And then these are, if you want to make them, Dan Thea is a very skilled winter chair maker. Cool. Adam, thank you for showing us this. And then out of curiosity, what were you doing before you before you got to North Bend Street School? I was uh, working at a cooperage. So I worked with a lot of white oak already. Ah, excellent. Amazing. Aram, thank you so much. Yeah. I just want to see this. I want to show people what Aram just turned here, what, just to have an eye level. Yeah. Something that he just turned. Well, this is this is Collins Windsor Rocker. Okay. But that's what Avram just turned. That's right. It's just amazing. Awesome. And these are very comfortable. They are. And I think the the design originally on the Windsor is 1600s and was from England originally. Yeah, they may have evolved from the Irish stick chairs, but. Cool. It became popular in Windsor, I guess, where they sold them. Mm. Ah. Mm -hmm. All right. That's awesome. Thank you very I much. Thank you. And I just want to throw in here while we're walking because our In the Making Public Program series, Colin was one of the first students, first students that we spoke with. Oh, yeah. When we closed down in early March, I had a conversation with him for In the Making where he, being at home, he went to forge wood and built himself a shape horse. And was made, you made spoons, right? Yep, just so, out of wood that I found at the local park that had already fell. Yeah. Nice. He here, so he was at home, and that's what he was doing. That's great. And I can recall uh, when Colin was an applicant, we were working together. Uh, he had built his own tiny home yeah. uh, before he got here. And also to share, uh, he is a United States Marine. Thank you. Colin, thanks so much. And then I, I I've sort of been asking as we've been going along, is there some place that we can go and see your work? Uh, Colin James Woodworking on Instagram. Very good. And Avram? Uh, Avram Tobin. All right. All right. Avram, Tobin. Avram Tobin. Thank you all. All right. What do we have next here? Where are we going next? Uh, um, what do you got for time? Until 11. Cool. Uh, so in 10 minutes, we're going to be heading over to... Uh, basic piano technology. Uh, hey, Steve, how are you? Steve, Steve Brown. Did I miss my chance? No, this is your chance. You're on. We are live without a net. Yeah, I was going to be working with Colin, so this is throwing me off a little. Oh, OK. Uh, yeah, I'm Steve Brown. I'm with the group in the basement, the pod that is the group that just started. This group just started in November. And uh, usually we're up here in what we call the incubator, but now we're downstairs. And um, they come in, we start them with the drawings. Have you talked about the drawings already or no? Uh, no, we sort of talked about where they start with um, uh, dovetails, toolboxes, okay. shaker nightstand. All right, well, before they get to that stuff, we start with joint drawings, which are small scale drawings of just particular joints, start from very simple, work up to more complex and um, sorry and we get into bench exercises we, we get into tuning up chisels and planes and then learning how to use them so these blocks here are what we call the practice block and we're basically learning how to work wood with edge tools um, we're going to flatten things 
and we're going to square them parallel all the way around until we've made a beautiful board. And then on the edges, we're going to learn some layouts for creating these chamfers, which are basically 45 degree bevels. And then there's also a system of laying out so that we can do these quarter rounds. And these are simple shapes here, but they're used in advanced situations. So cabriole legs or Chippendale chair posts, uh, these shaping systems come into play with much more complex um, examples. Um, a project that was just finished yesterday is this mallet. This is also, it's not just a mallet that we make, it's a lesson in using your hand plane again, learning how to flatten things. These pieces are glued on and in order to glue on um, the maple to the walnut, both surfaces have to be flat, dead flat. And that's something we're able to do with the hand plane. Um, and then we're learning turning as well on the lathe to get these shapes. So uh, all our, our exercises are kind of like this. They're packed with a lot of different um, issues, particular techniques. Um, this section is what we call the fundamentals. And the point of fundamentals is not so much that it's just beginning stuff, it's important stuff that pertains to all the advanced stuff that you're gonna do from here on out. That's I'm good. just gonna interrupt here. Do we have seven minutes to hop back? Lance has a little presentation that he was gonna show us. Sure. Do you mind? We have a few minutes left. Okay, great. Steve, okay? thanks so much. You're welcome. Steve, thank you. Steve just worked on a project for the, the bell carriage for, what was it? For my church and for Paul Revere Bell. For the Paul Revere Bell. So it's pretty cool. You can check our website out uh, for stories about uh, faculty, um, uh, students, and graduates. Hi, Lance. I'm working on that here. Oh, music stands. More music stands, right? Oh, yes. This is inspired by Charles Ross. Wow. Yeah, this book by Charles Ross. This is oh. actually crafts. It's about 1900. I've seen a student make the chair that's on the front. Yeah, uh, we, back in yeah, 2011. Oh. It's a famous chair that the met. <laughs> and uh, yeah, just fun stuff. This is a plant stand. Wow. This is a copper bowl and <laughs> for a plant. So cool. So I decided to throw up a music scene. So this is thrown up on the computer. For using this as a as sort of a, a template? Yeah. Wow. Looks the same, right? Yeah, it does. It looks exactly <laughs> I the same. I think it's too much work to do these holes and it's too crazy. Oh, so you didn't do those so holes. I did a simpler one. Oh, okay. and what is this First, made of? What? What is it made of? Oh, this is mahogany. This is a fun footing mahogany veneer mm -hmm. that was donated to the school. We have a lot of this downstairs. Oh, this came in that big donation recently. Yeah. So wow. students have used it on card tables and different things. Mm -hmm. So it's really veneered big. onto mahogany. Yeah, it's mahogany underneath. Yep. Wow. So just, and is this is this one adjustable like for oh, yeah. other music stands? Anyway, so I have to make it follow. I make a hexagonal. Uh huh. Uh, shape needs a three pieces put together to make the column. That's beautiful. And then you use they make too many And then you use the brass pins to make it adjustable. Yeah, it's indexing pins. So the angles adjustable and these are indexing pins. It's beautiful, lamps. Wow. Kind of big and crazy. <laughs> it's bigger than your two that are up front there. Some, some of you, this is, you want triple fold music. Oh, yeah, because you have to open it up so you don't yeah, have to turn so, the page. I, you know, I make music scenes of custom basis, and they have some of them want a bigger desk. Yeah. Do you ever make them with an extra partition that folds out? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's your next order. <laughs> Lance, thank you very much. All right. All right. Thank you, you so have a much great day. Colin, thank you. I uh, really appreciate uh, you being our host today in, in cabinet and furniture making. Absolutely. Thanks for coming by. You got it.
All right. So uh, that was cabinet and furniture making. Um, if you want to join us at noon, uh, I'll be with uh, our director of financial aid, Jamie Durgay, and uh, we will be um, giving an info session on admissions and financial aid uh, for the full-time accredited career training programs here at North Bennett Street School. Uh, we also do have continuing education classes. Uh, the director of continuing education, um, Katie Theodorus, uh, she is working very diligently uh, to bring a lot of the continuing education courses online. Um, and so we're all looking forward uh, to that. Um, uh, in the next few years, you're going to really see a lot more uh, delivery uh, in this uh, in this format. Uh, so we're uh, we're about to go into basic piano technology. Now, piano technology at North Bennet Street School. Uh, if anybody in the chat right now uh, can can share with us what the year that piano technology was founded, uh, we're going to send you a coffee mug. We'll mail it to you. Uh, so the first person in the, in the chat uh, to say the year that this program was founded, uh, a thing that I'll share about uh, piano technology here is it is the only uh, full-time program that started outside of North Bennett Street School and then very quickly came into the fold of, of uh, the education that we deliver here. Uh, it's kind of kind of interesting. Uh, Bill Garlick uh, was the founder, and uh, and I won't tell you the year. And uh, okay, so I'm going to turn this around and introduce you to faculty. And we're still here with our co-host Kristen Odell. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Hi, Rob. <laughs> Will you introduce yourself uh, for the audience here at home? Um, I am Emily Townsend, and I am one of the full-time instructors in the Basic Piano Technology Program. Um, this is my teaching assistant here for the year, Will Hello. Lover. And you're both graduates of the program? Yes, that's correct. That's great. Can we please um, feature this um, <laughs> award-winning Christmas sweater? Yes. Yeah, so, so uh, Will actually was one of the people uh, that wore this uh, sweater for our holiday party. He's 25% uh, of the people that <laughs> filled this up. Uh, and I believe, yes, there it is, a first prize winner uh, for the uh, ugly sweater contest. I and should mention we had a five-person team of myself, Eric Martin, Jonathan Paco, Brandon Ridge, and Juan Armando. We had an alternate because one person couldn't be there both times that we've worn this. But all the credit goes to my mom, Paula Roper. Thanks, Mom. Thanks. All right. Um, and I also want to announce we have Debbie Sear who's on screen answering questions as well. That's right. Thank Hi, you for Debbie. that, Kristen. Hi, Hi, Debbie. Debbie. Hey, Debbie. Okay, well, I think we'll start with just a quick walkthrough of the department, if that's okay with you guys. Let's do it. Okay, so since we're here, we'll start here. This is our classroom. So this is where our day begins every day. Um, we rearrange the furniture a little bit for today. Usually we are meticulously spaced six feet apart these days. And you can see everybody's got their own action model, a grand one-note model, and an upright um, one-note model, uh, which is a great instructional tool. And we have a whole collection as well of various different types, different manufacturers have different features and different designs. And we like to have samples of a few of the different kind of um, combinations. We have a library here um, with various reading materials. Um, so, you know, we, we teach sort of an overview here in the first year, but there's of course a whole lot of specialties that you can pursue um, if you're so inclined. And so we have here related reading for further study on certain subjects um, as they feel People. An interesting question that somebody asked us for book finding yesterday that could apply to this program. How much of your program is practical, hands-on, as opposed to reading? That is a good question. There's not a whole lot of actual reading for us. Um, there's no textbook for us, for instance. We give what amounts to a textbook over hundreds of handouts. I think it's something like three or four hundred handouts that I hand out throughout the course of the year. Um, but it's 
sort of shifts as the year goes on. So early in the year, we're in our seventh week right now, I think, with yes. this group of students. So we spend about half the day in the classroom, maybe a little half the day in the classroom doing lectures and demonstrations. And then the other half of the day will be practical application, time to practice tuning, practice in the shop. And as the year goes on, there's less and less of me standing around talking and more and more of them doing and practicing as they learn more of the skills, we give them more and more time to, to mm -hmm. apply them in different contexts. Great. Is it fair to say, Emily, that because of the handouts and the notes that people take, that you're es essentially building your own reference or textbook? That's what uh, we say, yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> that you kind of build your own textbook as you go. And we've started kind of binding things together, even for related subjects, because they're to help people stay organized. Basically. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so while we're walking, I just need to make a note that this um, four person award winning sweater was pre COVID, by the way. For oh, yeah, yes. that was two years ago. Yes, yeah. and I, I have measured the left and right, most heads are only five feet apart. So even with two people, it's not COVID compliant. Yeah, exactly. that'd be a lot of sheep to make a safe sweater. You can see we've got more pianos that we know what to do with, we're kind of sprinkled around. Um, but over here is one of our hallways of tuning practice rooms. Um, so maybe let's step into room seven here as an example. More pianos coming out our ears. And a ping pong table. Is that so people can decompress uh, from doing things with hand skills with other things that require hand skills? Yes, it's an intense year. <laughs> and so it's nice to have a way to unwind. We're not able to do ping pong right now, unfortunately, because, you know, and when the balls and paddles and things will work out, but someday um, that was donated to us by another graduate of the program who nice. came in and saw people playing ping pong with just a temperament stroke stretch across the table. One day. <laughs> <laughs> so um, a lot of our pianos, you can see we have a grand piano here and there's also an upright on the other side of the room. We have a combination, a good mix of grands and uprights because we need to know how to service both out there in the world. Um, a lot of these are donated to us from manufacturers. A lot of them are loaned to us from manufacturers and some are donated by private individuals as well. But we make a point of having pianos in a variety of um, manufacturers, ages, conditions um, that are all in serviceable condition, um, but you know, we don't have all top of the line pristine pianos because then when you go out into the world and that's not what your clients have, you're not prepared to service that. So we're very service oriented, very client oriented in that way. And we try to have a representative inventory um, for roughly the kinds of things that you'll encounter once you get out there in the world. That's great. About how many pianos do you think might be in the department for students to access? Debbie, are you there? 30? <laughs> Uh, 30, I think, 30-ish. Will's cool. doing a quick mental count. Just curious. 30-ish, I think. 30 sounds right. Yeah. All right. Um, I'll let you, I'll follow you out. Sure. <laughs> Mike, can I just make a note of the fun fact? of these spaces too that we talked about in our public program four was this part this part of the building was um the former police station an old police station and so these rooms were the bunk rooms for policemen to come and nap on their ships i i guess and so they naturally became piano tuning rooms that's right certainly no napping in those rooms anymore <laughs> As we come through here, on my right, we have a couple of quote unquote soundproof tuning boots. Anybody that spent some time in a college basement practice room might recognize these. They're mostly soundproof. We have four of them that each hold an upright piano. For our other tuning rooms, we actually don't want things to be completely soundproof. That's not an authentic um, tuning environment that you would expect out there in the world. And so um, we, we don't, go out of our way to try to make things perfectly um, 
perfectly isolated. Um, it is easier to tune that way, but again, not what you would encounter in the real world. Um, this is our shop area. And you'll spend some more time here later on with our repairs team. Um, but this is where we practice the repairs that are demonstrated in the classroom earlier in the day. Um, we have area technicians that donate equipment to us. So as pianos are getting condemned or donated or whatever, they will pull out actions and keys and things for us to practice on. Um, that's a real advantage over something like an apprenticeship situation. Because in an apprenticeship situation, you're probably working on a piano that belongs to a client, which means if you make a mistake, um, there are some real serious consequences for that. Um, some consequences that the customer might not be very happy about. And so it's nice for us here to have these um, that are serviceable, but a zero consequences situation. If they mess up on this one, they can just do the one next door. You practice and practice and practice until you really get it right. And then when you get to Mrs. Jones's house, you won't mess up on her piano. Um, Will, you're standing right there by the tuning levers. You want to say a word about our tuning hammer collection? Sure. Um, this is our, our, our vast collection of tuning levers. We have a few that are, are not hung up here because they are in use in tuning rooms. Uh, there's a lot of different styles and a lot of different makers of tuning levers. Um, we have some older models that are titanium and steel and as, as things used to be. But nowadays, there's a lot more carbon fiber. Uh, rigidity is really important when you're using a tuning lever um, because that is your connection to how the tuning pin actually turns in the pin block. And the more rigid it is, the more sensitive you can be and the more you can, more feedback you can get through your arm to know exactly what kind of a change that you're making. Uh, we have some uh, special tuning levers that are, are atypical, but for the most part, we have your, your classic tuning lever look like you see in a Norman Rockwell painting or uh, <laughs> you know, anything tuning lever. Um, uh, some of these are made by graduates or other technicians. The Rayburns are some graduates, yes. So we have, um, we have a lot of tuning levers and we like to have the students try as many as possible before they commit to one. Uh, I believe usually when we have a September school year, we say that by the time they come back in January, they should have their own. But until then, we encourage them to try as many tuning levers on as many pianos as possible to get a feel for what they like. There's different um, tip lengths, head degrees, tuning lever lengths, all of those things can drastically change the relationship that you, the technician, have with the tuning pin. And it's it's really important to find one that is comfortable. Uh, the tuning lever changes the technician, or ch chooses the technician. And we, um, we we like to have the, as much opportunity to play with that as possible. Well, briefly, what are these unusual ones used for? So these were designed by a technician named Dan Levitan. Um, who is a graduate. Who is a graduate. Uh, without getting too technical, there's a concept called flat pulling, which is about uh, angles that your tuning lever is at to the string. And um, it can be very good when controlled and very bad when you don't want to have it happen. Um, this is a tuning lever designed to control that, where you sit at the piano and you actually turn the pins this way instead of grabbing a tuning lever and you actually reach into the piano and tune that way. Uh, the, the more in line with the strings your tuning lever is, the less flag pulling there will be unless you actively put it in. So it gives you more control and it is a lot more ergonomic to be able to sit at the piano bench and turn this way is a lot better. Uh, many technicians will develop shoulder issues over time, um, just reaching into a piano all of the time. Uh, and speaking of ergonomics, we have also made by the Rayburns, we have these impact levers, which have an actual uh, 15 degree rotation of the tuning tip. So instead of on an upright, having your shoulder like this, you actually hold the tuning lever and it's got a weight on the end and you actually swing that around. Um, similar to uh, an impact driver that you would use to remove um, bolts on your car tire or such. It's, um, it's some pretty slick technology and it allows you to sit with your hand in a much more comfortable position when tuning uprights. Most careers that are ended because of physical issues come from tuning uprights for too long. That's great. Uh, and for everybody uh, who's just tuning in, or if you've been with us, we're in basic piano technology with uh, faculty member uh, Emily Townsend uh, and with Will Roper, who's a graduate and is here uh, assisting with instruction this year. Um, 
We also have Debbie Sear, who is, uh, she is in the chat room right now. Uh, and if you have any questions about piano technology, please uh, feel free uh, or just say hello. And we'll, um, we're taking some questions uh, from outside and I know you anticipated this. Somebody is interested in your hand injury uh, and wanted to know, is it related to piano technology? This is not a piano technology injury. Uh, we have some very uh, strict policies about leaving the school with the same number of fingers that you started with. Um, this is a cooking injury. Um, I had a knife slip while I was irresponsibly using a cutting board. And um, I, I had surgery about five weeks ago to repair a damaged nerve. I'm incredibly lucky that I have all my tendons and I still have my fingers, but this is not a school injury. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I, I hope that's uh, clear for everybody at home. And I appreciate you giving the exposition there. What are we gonna, what are we gonna see next, everybody? Um, just a few more things we're going out on our tour. Um, we don't need to go all the way down this hallway, but we have three, six more tuning practice rooms down this hallway. Brands, uprights, rebuilt pianos, newly manufactured pianos. We've got some that are in the 20 or 30 years old from, you know, we have American pianos, Asian pianos, all of that. Um, Another component of our shop setup is this spinning back, which is an old spinet that we just tore asunder so that students could practice replacing strings and splicing strings here before they have the higher stakes situation of doing it in a real piano. Um, and I think that is probably about it for um, the grand tour. Other stuff may come up as you see the students doing some work here in the next phases of the open house. That's great. We had another question I just saw come through. Um, if anybody knows what the oldest piano is that that we have uh, in the building. That's another question that Debbie might be able to answer. Um, and actually, that's worth asking again when we're in advance because yeah. it's probably up there. I think the oldest piano that we have in basic down here that is serviceable is probably 1920s. Okay, great. And then uh, Kristen pointed this out earlier. Uh, the, um, the tuning rooms that are down the hallway here uh, behind Emily are also a continuation of when this building used to be police station number one and uh, there were uh, bunks there for, uh, for the officers uh, to sleep in. And this is essentially the, the workshop uh, area for basic piano technology that we're in. Is it the action workshop or just All everything? Um, basic piano is, is designed to give you the skills you need to service pianos in client homes. And so our shop is fairly minimal in terms of power tools. We do a lot more hand tool work. Uh, and it's, it's things that you would want for action service and regulation and repairs of individual parts, but it's it's a little bit comprehensive. Um, when you guys get to see upstairs, um, you'll see the real the real power tools and the real the real action and rebuilding shops. But you also, whenever you come up here, you trip over these. You see them everywhere. <laughs> they're everywhere, they are. and they're just these magical little machines. I love them. It's called a whippet. It's a whippet. <laughs> uh, this reminds me of uh, uh, carbon fiber uh, parts. And so I feel like the piano as an instrument has not really changed that much in over 200 years or so, yet piano technology and some of the components uh, have changed. And I, and, uh, I wanna say the some carbon fiber or um, uh, synthetic. synthetic can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, we've got uh, later on in the tour, we've got set up a few action models to, to, to compare and look at some new parts, uh, including we have a uh, composite action from Kauai and a composite action from uh, West Lickling Gross uh, in a Mason and Hamlin action model. Uh, we've got a few um, composite actions in pianos as well. Great. Uh, for the most part, they're designed to be serviceable in the same way that you would service wooden parts. I don't think there's a lot of big right, parts, the, especially regulation. Yeah, the mechanics are the same. It's just the materials that are different. And the materials an upgrade because of sort of barometric pressure and, and that wood fluctuates? Um, 
it's uh, it's humidity concerns more so than barometric pressure concerns. Great. But yeah, those composite parts are more stable. They don't change dimensionally the way that wooden and felt parts do uh, when they're exposed to more or less moisture in the environment. So they they're more stable in that way. Thank you. Are you doing a sound? Do you have a sound test for us? Um, we do. We actually, um, uh, Emily and I can talk about this. Yes. To, okay. Yeah, let's. Well, it's not in the classroom. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Emily and I can talk about this department all day long, but uh, we want you to hear a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and again, thanks everybody for joining us from home. Uh, if you're just joining us or if you've been with us, we're in basic piano technology. It's a nine month full time program. Uh, and we are taking applications. There's an info session at noon today, um, and there's a start in this program next September. Hi, guys. Uh, Welcome back to the classroom. This is um, the group that we have dubbed Team Tune, um, <laughs> and we're going to talk a little bit about tuning and about why piano technology as a career exists and why it's great and why everyone should come here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Corey, I'm originally from Oklahoma. Um, uh, this, as you may be able to tell, or not, is a piano. <laughs> um, uh, it's basically how it works is you press down here, a lot happens here, a hammer comes up here and hits the string, which vibrates. The vibrations travel down the length of the string through. This lovely piece of wood here, or here, called the bridge, which is attached to the soundboard. It amplifies the vibrations, and that's what you hear when you play things. A common misconception with um, instruments, uh, while the strings are what make the pitch, the actual sound comes from usually something like um, the, the, the soundboard, um, which is the face of a guitar or of a violin. Um, and in this case, it's this huge piece of wood that spans most of the body of the piano. Uh, and one of our, our favorite demonstrations for that is our, is our music box test. Um, the, as I said, the, the string tension determines the pitch that the actual sound is created in the room from the, the movement of the soundboard displacing air um, and just sound is displaced air. So we have a music box, which you may be able to hear on the Zoom. Playing happy birthday. Mm -hmm. If I place it on the soundboard, that's incredible. <laughs> it, it's one of my favorite demos to, to do. It, um, Never gets old. No. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Sarah, hello. Um, so we're just going to talk a little bit about muting. So when we're tuning the piano, we tune one string at a time. And you'll see that uh, in some cases, certain keys have more than one string. So we do have single strings down here in the bass. They're the unicorns, followed by the bichords. Copper chords here, so there's two strings for some of these keys, and then we have the tri chords up here. So there's three strings for each key. So depending on whether we're tuning a bi chord or a tri chord, and what we're tuning, we have to mute one or two of the strings. So we do that with a number of different implements. So we've got a temperament strip, which is wool felt. We've got these rubber stoppers in, in different sizes. So when you're muting the piano, you do this, of course, before you start tuning. And um, you sometimes have to be a little bit creative about how you mute because different pianos are different. And of course, it's different with, um, with uprights. So I've already done most of this piano. So we've put the rubber stoppers down here around the struts. Sometimes you've got to be a little bit creative because our temperament strip doesn't always fit nicely in, in there. So I'll just finish. Right here, I've left a little bit free just to show you. So we're going in between the three strings of each note, and that's leaving the central string unmuted so we can tune that without any interference from the 
other two strings. So we just poke. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Oops. I was getting ahead of you. Oh, wrong pedal. There you go. There we go. So we raise the dampers just with the pedal, damper pedal, and then just gently put this in. You can see that. Right here, we've got to use a rubber neuter here because we don't have enough of a sort of, it, it's a not narrow enough area for this temperament strip to work. So we just scoot that under the strut. And then continue muting up here. Yeah. yeah, that one needs to be slightly corrected, but then we just continue up there. And then here, again, you can see I need to use my rubber stopper in there. So I just wedge that in to make sure that string is muted. Um, we, we mentioned earlier having our, our large inventory of different pianos. Um, a lot of, and as Sarah mentioned, all these pianos are different and you have to get really creative with the muting sometimes which is another reason in favor of having different different types of pianos, different experiences. The more that you do, the more that you see, the more you get the skills to tackle the new problems out in the field. Right. Um, and uh, before we leave tuning land real quick, um, we've got a slight, very, very, very quick tuning demo and explanation talking about some of the more, more technical difficulties and why this is a trade and not like um, the first lesson of when you learn how to play guitar is how to tune it. Um, this is not the first lesson of how you learn how to play a piano. You might want to show this. Um, okay. This is Thanks, Alicia. ATD, electric tuning device. Okay. So, uh, we use this to practice on um, like hammer technique. This is tuning hammer. Okay. So how to pull, push, and just get the tune. So, I want to mention that we are very much aural tuning and the ETV is used as a training device, but all of the exams are given orally and that's what the main thrust of our program is on aural tuning. This is sort of a supplementary tool. So right now it's out of tune, it's flat. And you have to stop the light. And you do test blow. And it goes flat. Sometimes it goes flat if you just go and you have to adjust that again. Um, when you when you come here and see us in person, we can do a lot more aural tuning demos. We like to do um, the ETD now because some of the the ear stuff is hard to explain and describe over Zoom. So. Please come in the future when you're allowed in the building. We'll we'll I'll talk about tuning all day long. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, great, Will. Alicia, um, thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a great day. Now we'll briefly go back to the shop and talk a little bit about what repairs we do, why we do, and a little bit of the, the techniques that we do. Ready? All right. This is Team Repairs. Hey, Team Repair. What are you working on? So I'm working on center tuning right now. Um, I'm only a month and a half in the, into the program, but I'm already learning a very important and a fairly common repair job that we have to service in the client's home or at the shop. So, um, when parts are all replaceable, it was easy to obtain new ones. <laughs> Nowadays, many parts are not available. It seems necessary, therefore, to restore many old parts. Normally, when a center pin, when a center is too loose, you simply replace the old pin with a new one, the next size larger. So, I just kind of recite what is in the notes, but I will show you what we are talking about here. So, typically, in a center pinning kit, 
you will have a suitable carrying case, which is my folder here. Um, you have a micrometer to measure what, what the, uh, the pin size originally um, in, in um, here. Um, a center pin nipper, a brooch set, numbered correspondingly to uh, the pin sizes, and the repinning tool. So as you can see, one side is to push the pin out. The other side is to push the pin back. Okay, so to demonstrate better for our audience here, I have a gigantic size. <laughs> oh, wow. It's like a robot. show you what we really, really, really are trying to talk uh, or explain or demonstrate. So the center pin, which is the, this thing here. In this should, case, it's a hammer shank from an upright. <laughs> so the center pin should be held very firmly by the bird side, which I'll show you later what it looks like. It should pivot inside the bushing. Mm -hmm. The green bushings here, and we would, we should never, never, never ream the bird side. <laughs> so, can I just make clear this? That is a larger example oh, of yes. what this is. This tiny little mechanism, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that would be from a very large piano. Right. <laughs> so. Nowadays, I have a little iPhone camera that I project onto the big television in the classroom, or we have another one in here now, actually. But in the old days, when we didn't have that, that technology, I needed larger than life props. <laughs> so you could see it from the back of the room? Exactly, exactly. So that's kind of a throwback, but we still use it. <laughs> yeah, and it's great for today, so thank you. We, um, we tend to adjust friction in these. It's, it's, it's one of the most important relationships between the player and the hammer hitting the string. And we'll do that with the broke set um, to remove material here or with the center pins by, by actually adding a larger size here. Um, you can't remove, you can't add material once it's been removed. And so we're constantly sort of following after making this larger and then making the pin larger um, sort of in tandem. Um, we can come over here for a second. Uh, what are you working on, Maddie? Oh, I am working on rebushing keys. So keys, here, let me show you, these little red bushings or cloth in the middle of the key and here at the bottom and the front. And when they get worn down from age or playing, they get kind of smaller, more compressed to the side. And then that makes they're like a, a wiggle room uh, with the key, which players don't want. Um, and so we rebush them. So we take out the bushings, so it's just an empty hole, and then we put in new ones. And so they're like that, and then we fit them on the key frame here, where all of these are, and make sure they're adjusted properly um, so that they work how they need to. Oh, that's great. I have a question while we're standing yeah. here. The dental picks are something oh, yeah. that we sell in the piano technology kits. What do you use them for? So they are used for scraping out or gently scraping out <laughs> <laughs> um, any glue or fuzzies from the cloth in here from the old belts. And so we just slowly try and work those out of there with these so and yes the wood is not ruined and it's a dental kit set it's actually dental tools yeah which is crazy to me so we work quite well for the job sort of like dentists we have a lot of small things and a lot of crowded places that we need to scrape clean so that makes sense <laughs> That's what makes work. yeah we'll actually refer to the blocks on either side of the keyboard as the cheeks of the piano. Um, and I would prefer it, we don't we don't call it that, but it implies that the uh, the piano keys themselves are the teeth. Um, in many ways, we are just large doing large dental work with them, much lower stakes. <laughs> <laughs> it's not as big a deal if you leave a tool at a piano. Hi yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi everybody. Um, I'm working on wire work today, so working with music wire which is what we use to string all of our pianos, unless it's a bass string, which is actually wrapped in copper. So it's a steel piece of uh, metal. Um, and so we use different sizes of these to actually string the piano. 
Um, and then in the base section, we have um, what's similar of a steel core, but then we actually wrap around it with copper so that it has an extra um, amount of reverberation. But today I'm actually not working on stringing this moment. I'm actually working on a couple different things that we need to do for repairs and for also um, just regulation. I have a couple things here. We have um, what is called a um, just a coil with a becket right here. And this is what we have um, to put into the tuning pin to make sure that the string actually stays inside. And then it wraps around as the tuning pin moves. So that's what changes the pitch. Um, we also have splicing as well. You can see that there's two little loops and two little tails that come out from the inside. Um, this is what happens when we break a string string and we're un, uh, for whatever reason not um, able to actually restring in the moment. So instead we actually splice two pieces of music wire together. Um, I'll try to get up closer so you can see that. Um, this is my favorite. Personally, I think this is so much fun. There are um, a few different knots that you can use, but they're sure. all designed to hold under tension. Um, that's our favorite. It's the most neat. It's the most tidy. It's the cleanest knot. Oh, but in yeah. general... Uh, is there a name for it? Um, uh, tuner's knot. Tuner yeah, splice. Um, is there is there a specific name for our, our splice knot? Uh, we call it the tuner's knot. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, it's easy-ish to work with when it's not at tension and when it's under tension, it tightens itself as you go. So it can hold the 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 immense amounts of tension that music wire is under. Um, I believe a whole piano is around two tons. Twenty. Twenty tons. Sorry. Wow. Twenty yeah. tons of tension on the soundboard. Yeah. It's it's immense. Um, I think I heard somewhere that you could string up all the music wire on a piano to a um, train car, and the act of tuning the piano would literally lift it off the ground. Wow. It's it's uh, intense. Um, we'll get a little bit more on music wire in a few minutes, but how about we come down to one of our tuning rooms and we'll talk very briefly about how the action works and a little bit of what we do to regulate it. Um. Rob, I'm going to head back down to the store. I'm going to leave you all here because I'm have I'm on in 10 minutes. Okay, that's okay. great. Thank you all. So see you soon. We'll see you in 10 minutes, Kristen. A lot of people are familiar with tuning, the act of tuning, um, where we adjust the tuning pins and change the tension, but less people are familiar with the concept of action regulation, uh, which is one of the things that we teach here. So I'm going to turn it over to team regulation. Hey, team regulation. How are you? Good. Just working on that. I was working on let off, and I can show you that. I think it's easy to forget that a piano is a collection of a lot of moving parts. The keys don't make a sound. There's all of these things in here. So that should be this. And if I get strong and move this on the bench, you can take a look at it. Great. And now we are being joined by uh, an audience uh, from home. So if you would just say hello and and uh, and uh, introduce yourself briefly. That'd be fantastic. Hi, I'm Scott. Hi, I'm Lindsay. Hey, Lindsay. Hey, Scott. So here we have the engine of the instrument. We have this part here we call the lift-in, and move this hammer up. And I have over here some of the regulating tools that we have. We use these to turn all of these hundreds of fine screws inside of just one piano. Um, I was just working on the let off, which is where at some point the key has to stop moving the hammer. Otherwise, when it, the hammer hits the string, it won't bounce back off and it will stop the sound. I can show you that. I did that on one of these notes. <laughs> so, regulate, or when we're learning regulating regulation. One of the first things we do learn is let off because it's easy and it doesn't mess up a lot of other things. So I this back in. So this note here, I set it so that you can tell the hammer is cutting off the sound. Can you get the hammer in a little closer? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. And this neighbor note, I have it set too loose. It's letting go of the hammer too far away from the string. Both of these are bad because when it's too far away from the string, I'm no longer allowed to play very soft with control. So that's one of the aspects of regulation that we deal with amongst many other things to get this feeling and playing well. 
You guys watch all some action models real quick? Let's do it. Let's pop over to room 17 real quick. Okay. We'll, we'll get to see a little bit more of that action work. I'll follow you. That's great. I feel like, at, you know, the technician's role here, um, because the, the musician wants this instrument to be as responsive and dynamic as possible. And so all of this, uh, the intricacy of the work is, is, is just fantastic. All right, so to start off, we have a few action models over here for our grand ones. So basically, you saw the entire action out. So this is just one part, one little piece. So you can kind of see it better moving. So we have a Kauai action right here. Nice. Right here we have a Mason and Hamlin. And over here we have a Steinway. <laughs> nice. And the cool thing about this one is it also shows you the pedals and everything. You can see the damper come up on the mat. And just a little more on regulation. You can get a closer look here. So it's pretty amazing what all these little tiny little screws can do. So if you look, everything's working properly. But if you just, let's see, twist it a little bit. Oh, oh my gosh, it's stuck. Okay, there we are. Then it, the hammer doesn't even come up to hit the string. Huh. So just those tiny little adjustments really make a big difference. Um, I definitely like to think of um, regulation as like, um, it's like you're when you're taking care of your car. A tuning is like an oil change, right? You get it done every so often. To, but if you only have an oil change and you don't do anything else, then everything else might get neglected and the, your car's not gonna work as nice. It's the same thing with the piano. So every few years or so, um, it should be regulated and so, uh, your panel will work so much better. <laughs> For homes, we recommend somewhere between 10 and 20 years, sometimes, sometimes sooner. Um, if it's a concert grand on a stage, it'll get a regulation touch up maybe every week. Um, giving the player that level of control is really important. Um, and one of the things we talk about here are home regulation specs versus concert regulation specs. Uh, as I mentioned before, most of what we do here is for home service and regulation. Um, but uh, you know, wood and felt and cloth all swell and change with humidity, just like the soundboard does. And so there, there are actions out there that work really well in the winter and then seize up in the summer. And so uh, learning how to set that so that you could survive four seasons, especially in New England, um, is, is a huge part of our job. Uh, we have a few different types of models. We have some grants here, which um, we, we talked a little bit about. We have some upright models here. Um, I'll point out the Mason and Hamlin composite action we talked about a little bit before. Right. Fiberglass parts and a carbon fiber shank. Um, and then here we have a Kauai action, which also has um, some synthetic um, composite parts. Um, those are the two companies that are really pushing and pioneering composite actions right now um, that we talk to. And we're also both, both um, we have people like Kauai and Mason and Hamlin who are friends of the program. Um, and behind you, Rob, Yes. We have an example of a spinet action model. Um, spinets are the shorter uprights. They're very popular in the, the 50s and 60s um, and so on. Uh, mostly, we don't, we don't make spinets anymore, uh, partially because of the electric keyboard. Um, but what the way you can get it so short is you have what we call a drop action, where instead of the key pushing up on the, on the whipping, um, we actually have the key pushing up on a, a sticker or some kind of connector that pulls up on the whippet. Um, they are much harder to service and um, have their own sets of issues. So we try to make sure we have a few of them here as well as more common uprights and grands. Uh, depending on the area of the country that you end up servicing, you'll see more or less of these, but they're out there and they're important to know how to work on. They're nobody's favorite pianos to work on. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot of them out there. Um, I wanted to circle back because I really like Lindsay's car analogy for piano service. And you might have heard Lindsay say, oh, get a piano regulated every three to five years. And then you heard Will say, oh, every 10 to 20 years. It really depends on the client, the setting, and how often you use your piano. So in the car analogy, they don't say, oh, okay, get your brake pads replaced every 
three years, they say do it every X number of miles. And so it really depends on how heavily the piano is played. And there are some things that just kind of compress and wear, and there are some things that we can adjust like you can in a car. And then there are some things that are wear items like brake pads, that would be, for instance, like the key bushings that we saw Maddie working on earlier. And so that's, um, it's a good analogy for customers too, because everybody's used to taking care of a car or more people are used to taking care of a car than they are, you know. Right, and I'm, I'm gonna just, uh, if I yeah. can add on to your, because I love analogies, and when I'm talking to uh, prospective students, uh, many prospective students for piano technology are performers, uh, musical performers. And I'm, I like to talk about the, the performer is the race car driver and the piano technician is kind of head of the pit crew. Yeah. So we've got this whole automotive, dental things. I don't know how many other analogies we can get going, but um, it's pretty cool. Um, I just want to do a time check because uh, Kristen is at quarter of the hour um, is going to be um, uh, visiting uh, and talking with a bunch of alumni. Uh, so anybody got a it's, time? It is, it is 11.44. All now. right. And that's, that's, um, that's all we got. Just about all we have prepared for you guys. Thank you so much, everybody. This has been fantastic. I uh, really appreciate it. And uh, join us for our full-time info session uh, for admissions and financial aid um, at, uh, at 12 o'clock and at uh and right now we're going to switch you right over to Kristen uh in the gallery thanks everybody in piano technology thanks, thanks very you. much hey everyone bye debbie bye rob hi everyone i'm Kristen. um i hope you can hear me as per usual, because this is Zoom land, well, I'll never know. Um, I'm here in the school store and usually I sell tools to the students for the full-time program and continuing education and um, handmade goods by our student and alumni. And today, as same was yesterday, I'm featuring some objects that are made by students and alumni, mostly alumni, that you can purchase on our online store. Um, by way of nbss.edu slash store. And um, these are, I'm showing these for holiday gifts, Christmas gifts, um, whatever gifts, Valentine's, whenever. So I'm gonna get started. Um, our, our topic today is wood because we spent time in cabinet and furniture and um, um, yesterday was paper and books because we went into bookbinding. So my first object here I'm gonna share is um, work by Grant Berger, who's a graduate of our cabinet and furniture making program. Um, we sell these lidded bowls by Grant and they're just so cool. This one is really deep. This one is um, maple and torch sapelli wood. This is 210, $210. You can find it on our online store. Um, and I also have a smaller version made of cherry and mahogany. Um, they're just great. I have one at home um, on my desk and it, currently it's housing the cash for my plumber for whenever he shows up to pick, his, his, pick up his money. So these are awesome for anything, any little treats or you know doodads that you need to store in a lidded bowl. Um, the next thing I'm gonna share with you are these geometric cutting boards. These are amazing mind-bending, you know, uh, cheese boards, cutting boards made by Ryan Messier, who's um, a graduate of cabinet and furniture and a continuing education instructor, as well as Grant Berger as a CE instructor. Um, this is actually the last one that I have. I just sold my two smaller versions of this yesterday. So this is on the online store, also 210. This is made of maple, cherry, and black walnut, um, finished in beeswax and mineral oil for, for food safe needs. Um, I wanna note also for those two makers, Ryan Messier and Grant Berger, they, aside from these little objects they make that I sell in the store, they do a lot of in-house, um, you know, custom work. They, I both, I see them both sort of working on site doing um, custom cabinetry, custom build outs. And that's what a lot of our cabinet and furniture making students um, do as well. It's just wonderful work. The next object I'm gonna show you is 
um, a truly analog nutcracker made by Ellen Caspern. These are so cool. Um, I sell these on the online store for $125. I have them in walnut and cherry, um, finished in um, with food grade mineral oil. So again, food safe. And she kindly provided me with some walnuts so I can actually show you the action of these. They're so cool, I love them. So I'm gonna just hold the, the walnut so it doesn't go flying and it's cracked. I'm not gonna eat it on screen because um, that would not be very chic. So now I have a shelled walnut. So cherry and walnut, these are available. Um, the next item I'm gonna share with you are these, oh, here's the walnut just to prove to you that it actually worked. So I'll save that for later. Um, our marking gauges. These are made by Bob Miller of Mass Woodworks, who is, um, uh, he's part of our CE, our continuing education program. He's CE tech and an instructor. And he makes these incredible marking gauges. This one is hard maple. Um, we sell these to our students, but also anybody, you know, doing woodworking. This is a must tool and these are just beautifully made. So I have a hard maple. And I have this specialty one that is made from Wenge and Brass um, for 325. It's the only one that I have. Um, you can buy both of these on the online store. Great gifts, great for your own needs, for your own work, woodworking. He also has some even fancier versions of these on his store, which is, um, I believe, masswoodworks.com. Um, anyway, that's his business. So you can find him there. And I sell both of these on our online store, again, nbss.edu slash store. Um, the next sort of unusual object I'm gonna share with you that might segue us into um, tomorrow's um, hour long sort of pop-in store, um, store hour where we're gonna feature a jewelry maker are these beautiful pieces of jewelry that are made by Paul Koenig, who's a continuing educator, sorry, he's a graduate of cabinet and furniture. And these, they're, they're various wood species um, inlaid, veneered with brass inlay parts in them. I'm sure you can't really tell on the screen how fine they are, but they're just gorgeous. There's better images on the online store. Um, I love them. I have one and if you're you know, looking to incorporate wood into your attire, this is the way to do it. This is actually my own personal one and I often wear it on the lapel of my coat and I love it. This one happens to be um, walnut and brass inlay and maple, brass and walnut. They're just so cool. So for um, incorporating wood into your attire, that is where you wanna be. And the last non-wood yet wood related item that I sell in the store is the wood book. It's amazing. This was compiled between 1888 and 1913, the original using actual, um, you know, my very thin sheets, veneered sheets of wood specimens. And so this is a reprint of that. And it basically is a volume of all wood species. It is, so beautiful. And this I sell for $44 on the online store. Um, today and tomorrow is really your last day to buy items in the online store to be shipped for Christmas because we are closed for two weeks beginning next week. So um, buy those today or tomorrow for Christmas gifts. And I have time for um, one more object here. Well, there's two. These are French rolling pins made by Steve Brown who is a cabinet furniture making instructor. And they're beautiful. Um, it's just a simple French rolling pin. This one is cherry and I'm selling it for $45. You will not find this on the online store. Please email me if you would like to buy this at store at nbss.edu. Um, I just haven't had time to photograph these for the online store. So again, this is cherry um, at $45. And then I have this smaller version made of figured maple for $40. 
Um, I, you know, it's kind of shorter. It's a, it's a little smaller of a rolling pin, but um, I imagine if I ever get into cake decorating and maybe rolling out fondant or something, something like that, or little, little sort of decorative things for a cake, I would use this one. So those are my wood objects. I also have some spatulas here if you're interested. These are also made by Bob Miller of Mass Woodworks, two wooden spatulas. So that is my hardwood feature today. Um, shop online, shop the store. Today, tomorrow would be the last day to shop um, for Christmas delivery. So um, email me with any questions, um, store at nbss.edu. And maybe this lidded bowl is in your future. I mean, I can think of a lot of um, maybe some peanut M&Ms that would be that would be my thing that I would house in this for sure. Um, the last geometric cutting board. Don't forget, this is the last one available. Two ten on the online store. And that's it. Shop our online store. Shop small. And I think we're just about ready to hand this over to Rob in admissions. He's going to um, Rob. Rob O'Dwyer and Jamie Dergay are talking to us about um, admissions and financial aid. And we're just gonna see where he is. In the meantime, while we're waiting for him, I can show you a few other things. Give me one second. Not so much wood objects, but woodworking tools. Um, this is a, an illustration done by Yibin Yang, who's a bookbinding graduate. And um, this also, so this is great for a woodworker because it's actually a, a sketch of a woodworking tool, but great testament to the diversity of backgrounds in our students that come to us. Yibin came to us as an illustrator, went into the bookbinding program, did a, did, did a sketch of a woodworking tool and now we're selling it for her in the store. And there's Rob. So I'm gonna turn this over to Rob and Jamie. How's it going? Thanks, Kristen, long Thank time no all. see. Yeah, I'll see you soon. Great, yeah, that was really fun. Um, uh, we'll be going to Advance Piano uh, uh, after this info session. Um, thanks everybody for joining us from wherever you are uh, for our first virtual open house. Um, this is our uh, 28th open house. Uh, it is the 149th year uh, that uh, North Bennett Street School uh, has been uh, training people. Um, I'm here uh, with a whole host of friends and colleagues uh, and, and this afternoon, I'm with uh, our Director of Financial Aid, Jamie Dergay. Um, Jamie not only is our Director of Financial Aid, but he also um, will work with international students um, to help them obtain their uh, M1 visa and uh, their I-20 uh, when they're on the way in. Um, uh, and then Jamie is also our Certifying Officer uh, for veterans benefits uh, as well. So um, he's here with us. And what we have uh, talked about because Jamie's working remotely, uh, many of us are, um, uh, I'm in today uh, in my office uh, and I'm so glad to be here. Um, but the format that Jamie and I uh, have uh, worked out for you is I'm gonna talk about admissions uh, for about the first half of the hour. Um, and then uh, we'll, talk about financial aid, um, which is the way to support um, students that are coming here. Uh, so financial aid, including um, scholarship uh, and uh, FAFSA uh, and all those kind of things. Uh, Jamie is your go-to person. Uh, he's an expert uh, and really happy to uh, have him on the team. In fact, the whole team is here. Sharon Stetson uh, is also uh, on the chat. So if anyone has any questions about admissions, uh, Sharon can answer those questions on the chat. The website is a fantastic tool, so I encourage people to, uh, to visit there. Um, 
And I am going to, let me see, I'm gonna share my screen here with everybody. Uh, and both Jamie and I have a, uh, uh, some slideshows uh, that we can share. Uh, and we'll walk you through those. Uh, just to say the format here, um, I'm super pleased with uh, everyone uh, coming to join us. Uh, so thank you for that. And I just wanna say faculty and students are just doing an excellent job. All of the talks, demonstrations, um, I'm really happy uh, to be able to share all that North Bend Street School has to offer uh, with everyone. And then, okay, so, uh, you can see here, uh, if you were with us earlier, that's cabinet and furniture making. Um, that uh, looks like Nick Michaud on the left um, and Dimitri Norris on the right, uh, turning a, a tabletop. And um, just going to uh, say welcome everybody again. Um, and if you didn't hear me say this earlier, uh, Colleen walsh Powell, our Director of Development, uh, she asked everybody to chime in who's on chat, just to say where you're from uh, geographically. Um, you can say what program you're interested in. Uh, you can share what organization that you're with. Uh, and please do that because, uh, you know, this, this virtual format, uh, I'm glad that it's here. Um, it can be a challenging way to interact with people. And so, um, you know, this is a great way for us to engage. Um, uh, okay, so uh, I do want to start off the, the top of our talk about admissions and financial aid uh, around uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, it is uh, an institutional priority here at North Bennett Street School, um, and President Sarah Turner um, has made it so uh, with the support of our board of directors, and um, Joe, just so excited about uh, this initiative. Uh, here uh, for admissions. You know, we're in a really unique uh, position uh, as a post-secondary vocational uh, training school uh, to be able to impact uh, the industries that we train for, uh, many of which are highly specialized and could be considered in a way a micro industry. Uh, and, and so, you know, part of this is around uh, creating access uh, for people. Uh, yesterday, I mentioned um, that in some way uh, that the attraction to programs here at North Bend Street School transcends demographics. Um, you know, organically, the, the generational diversity uh, is, is a range of 18 to people in their 60s uh, and sometimes older. Um, uh, but with understanding that that the attraction and the work does transcend demographics. At the same time, you know, there are underserved populations um, that have barriers to access. And so we wanna broadcast far and wide that we are here for you. Uh, we wanna work with everyone uh, who is interested in uh, thinking about training for a career uh, where we offer uh, this training. And this team uh, here, um, is ready and more than willing uh, to work with you. Um, we have a lot of recruitment partners. Um, there's uh, high schools, uh, there's uh, vocational high schools. Um, we have even in the past had uh, third graders come and visit us uh, from Milton Academy, uh, which has been great. We've got relationships with uh, community-based organizations, um, and government agencies. Uh, and we work with all of these partners uh, to help to identify uh, people that are interested, um, to educate people as to what these, uh, what these industries are and what the full-time programs um, are here as well. Um, we do have continuing education classes that are, that are great just for people who want to join them, uh, as well as people that are thinking about um, attending uh, the full-time programs as well. Um, I did want to put a call out and I'll put a slide up um, a little bit later that has uh, contact information. Uh, it's admissions at nbss.edu. Uh, we started uh, hosting webinars as an info session for 
uh, for the full-time programs here before uh, the pandemic. But once the pandemic rolled in, this has really been our main way uh, to communicate with people. Um, and so I ask you, either as an individual or as a representative of a school or organization, reach out to us and we'll schedule uh, an information session uh, with you. Um, history of North Penn Street School is very important. Um, we're located in Boston's North End. Uh, we're founded in 1881. Um, you know, we're... Uh, in the North End, uh, there was a lot of uh, new Bostonians or uh, what's been uh, referred to as immigrants. Uh, and Pauline Agassiz Shaw started North Bend Street uh, Industrial School uh, as a way to help people to assimilate uh, and train for, uh, for a career. Um, all of those things have to do with hand skills um, and very quickly, uh, she identified a, a methodology that is called SLOID uh, that is from Scandinavia um, as a way to deliver uh, training uh, for jobs and careers that require hand skills. Um, uh, a long time ago in the 1800s, uh, there, were, there were courses uh, for children, um, uh, adults, day and night. Some of those things were social, uh, and then we also uh, offered social services, um, which have since been taken up uh, by many other uh, organizations, private or um, government. Uh, the other thing about how we're founded is that we're connected to the arts and crafts movement. Um, you know, in the age of the mechanical industrial revolution, uh, the factories and, and machine production uh, was, uh, was in essence about uh, productivity, um, uh, profit margins, so many things. And the arts and crafts movement uh, grew uh, as a very human response uh, around craft. And when I say craft, what I mean is uh, each person's uh, individual comprehensive uh, skill base in order to make something in its entirety. And I'd say that that thread of, of training people to make things at the highest human quality possible uh, and the Sloyd methodology behind delivering the curriculum are all things that are very much alive here um, at North Bennett Street School. Uh, I wanna talk about our community. Uh, we have an excellent community that is worldwide. Uh, many of those things are tied uh, to the trade uh, and, and the things that hold our community together are the people, um, the, the faculty members, uh, staff, students, graduates, uh, employers, uh, partners. It's a, it's a web uh, around the world that I think is very supportive uh, and, and it's, uh, it's fantastic to be a part of because working at such a small scale we're able to bear witness to what the progress is. Um, and I would say, uh, because I'm uh, the recruiter for the school for full-time programs, uh, we really benefit from employers, graduates, uh, everyone that's out in the world that's referring people uh, by word of mouth. Um, it is a community that's very supportive. Uh, in many cases, when you're in a full-time program here, you might be uh, at a time where you're around the largest number of people uh, that are interested in a certain thing, uh, being a bench jeweler, a book binder, a piano technician, a furniture maker. And so the time here is precious and it's something that people carry uh, with them. Uh, Starting with the end in mind, uh, you know, we are training people for careers. Uh, we've got a fantastic uh, director of student life and career services, uh, Brian McGrath. Um, and, you know, he is helping people to uh, get prepared uh, for training. Uh, he manages um, uh, a jobs and career commission board uh, that you can access uh, through our main, um, through our home page. Uh, he works with everyone individually. Uh, he works with the programs. Uh, and there's sort of a two-tiered approach to 
uh, to the networking and preparation for employment. One is specific to the programs through faculty and their networks. And the other is through our director of student life and career services. Uh, and it's, a, uh, it's just a great, uh, a great relationship. Uh, and, and I would add that our employment rates are on average about 85% uh, across all nine programs pretty consistently. There's, there's some ups and downs because of the small numbers, but that's where we are. We are accredited by the ACCSC. And as a, uh, as a career school, the way that uh, the accreditation uh, makes sure that we're doing what we're saying we're doing is they'll check in with us on an annual and every few years. And I wanna say their threshold is we need to have about 60% of uh, graduates be employable in the field uh, 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 within the, a year from graduation. Uh, and I'm happy to say that we're, uh, we're usually above compliance there. Um, I also wanna talk about safety. Safety has always been a priority at North Bennett Street School. Um, when we're hosting info sessions, which are usually every Monday, you can see it on our website. Uh, one of the first questions uh, that, that I'll get is, are we still delivering uh, hands-on face-to-face training? Uh, and the answer is yes. Um, if you've been with us on these tours uh, over the last two days, and uh, we'll do it again tomorrow, uh, you can see uh, that uh, everyone is wearing masks, uh, uh, maintaining a safe physical distance. Um, there's a number of uh, precautions that uh, have been put in place. There was a team of uh, student workers over uh, the summertime that built many of the partitions that you've seen. Um, and uh, this is something I think that's given uh, all of us here a great sense of confidence. Um, the, the response team here uh, around the pandemic uh, has just been fantastic uh, and is in many ways the reason why we are able uh, to operate at this time uh, so safely uh, and effectively. Uh, so speaking of which, we are still recruiting. Uh, we have four programs that are gonna start in February that we're taking applications for uh, right now. Uh, and then uh, we have an extended deadline for all of the programs of February 1st. Uh, for the September starts in all nine programs. And then on this slide, I just put uh, the link which you can find on our homepage. Uh, if you wanna dig deeper into our safety protocols, uh, you can see the, the link that's there. Um, okay, so we have nine full-time programs. Uh, they are book binding, cabinet and furniture making, carpentry, jewelry making and repair, locksmithing and security technology, piano technology, basic piano technology, and advanced piano technology, preservation carpentry, and violin making and repair. Uh, so all nine of these programs are standalones. Uh, what I mean by that is that uh, once, you, uh, once you begin one of these programs, uh, you will pick up the skill and the confidence to go out and be employable uh, in the field. Um, the programs are all different lengths. Uh, we have nine month programs, we have 18 month programs, and violin making is a 30 month program. Uh, different than an academic uh, higher education experience, uh, which is on a format of credit hours, the programs at North Bennett Street School are based on clock hours. Uh, and I'd say, each program is a little bit different as far as the start times and the overall amount of hours, but the school and the faculty uh, have gotten together and agreed uh, on what is the correct amount of time to train you uh, from soup to nuts, from the beginning to uh, being at a place where you're employable. Uh, and that's how we've landed on those different times, nine months, 18 months and uh, 30 months respectively. Um, I'll walk you through on the list that's on the slide. Book binding uh, is an 18 month program. We visited there yesterday uh, and that 
Um, that program starts uh, every September. Uh, so February 1st would be your deadline uh, to apply for this coming start. Cabinet and furniture making is an 18 month program as well. Uh, there are two start times for cabinet and furniture making. Uh, they are usually every September and every February. Uh, because of the pandemic, we've had some delayed starts in a few programs, uh, cabinet and furniture being one of them. Uh, so we started uh, new students in November and uh, we're going to be starting our spring start uh, in March this year. Um, carpentry is a nine month program and uh, carpentry uh, starts every September. Uh, jewelry making and repair uh, is an 18 month program. Uh, and similar to cabinet and furniture making, there are two start dates uh, as well. Uh, February and September are the next two uh, start dates um, that are available. Uh, locksmithing and security technology is a nine month program. It's also, when you compare the amount of clock hours, it's also the one that has the smallest amount uh, compared to the other programs. It's just over 900 hours. These details can be found on our website on each one of the full-time uh, program pages. Um, and then locksmithing and security technology also has two starts a year. So February is our next start uh, and, and September is the start after that. Piano technology, which we just visited, uh, basic piano technology, if you've been with us, um, there is a, they are both nine month and separately accredited programs. Uh, so I'll spend a minute here just talking a little bit about the difference and then I'll go back and I'll talk a little bit about each one of these programs as well. Uh, so basic piano technology, um, if you were listening to uh, Emily and Will a little bit ago, basic technology is gonna teach you how to tune, um, how to regulate, um, which is getting all the moving parts moving the way they should, and how to do basic home repairs where you really don't need machinery. Uh, so you can graduate from basic piano technology and uh, go out and work for yourself uh, where there's a, an open market uh, and we will help you to understand what that means while you're in the program. And then you can go out and start um, you know, making money as a piano technician um, tuning residential uh, pianos uh, for private owners and doing those small repairs and things. Um, advanced piano technology is where uh, you will work um, uh, on a small team to restore a piano in its entirety. Uh, now, when I say in its entirety, the only thing that we don't do in advanced piano technology is the, uh, the finish around the case uh, of the piano, uh, which is yet another uh, career specialization uh, that people can get into. Um, and we'll be visiting advanced piano technology right after, after this. And then just if you're just joining us, I just wanna say hello. Um, there is a chat function. I can't see it the, when I'm uh, sharing these slides, uh, but my colleague, Sharon Stetson uh, in, in admissions, uh, she is uh, staffing the, the chat room. Um, and then we also have uh, lined up for us our director of financial aid, Jamie Durgay, uh, who'll be joining us in just a little bit. Um, and then I also just wanna give uh, a shout out uh, to the team in the control room um, our marketing and communications team, uh, Barbara Rutkowski and Kevin Derrick, uh, thank you for helping us uh, uh, deliver this to everybody. And all of you out there, thank you for joining us. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, preservation Carpentry uh, is uh, a 18-month program that also starts uh, every September and violin making and repair is our longest program. Uh, most of these programs will have a nine month academic year. Uh, violin making and repair is a 30 month uh, program. 
Uh, so each one of these programs, the industries uh, has, you know, a lot of specific uh, uh, information about them. Uh, there is no shortage of nuance. And that is uh, my job to share that with you. Um, in this format, I'm just going to try and give a general overview of all these things. And as I've asked before, um, you can reach out to the admissions team. Uh, we're happy to meet with you by phone uh, or by video chat um, as individuals and as groups. Again, the website is a fantastic resource. Um, you can check out the Frequently Asked Questions page, uh, the financial aid page, uh, and all of the uh, full-time program pages uh, as well. Um, and then I did mention continuing education. Uh, right now, uh, because of the pandemic impact, uh, the way that we're delivering the full-time program safely, um, continuing education is right now not offering in-person training, but uh, we are working on online delivery, which is another initiative, uh, which we're all very excited about. Um, speaking of which, uh, there's, there's a few courses uh, that are available. Today, we'll be hearing from uh, Renee Kelsey, who's gonna be talking about uh, piano technicians tools and Eli Cleveland, uh, who will be giving a class uh, after around 2.30 um, on SketchUp. Um, okay, so start dates and deadlines. I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but just to have it be clear for everyone here, um, February 8th is our very next start date. We are still taking applications for all four of these programs, jewelry making and repair, locksmithing and security technology, uh, violin making uh, and repair. And even though the start date is a little uh, different here for cabinet and furniture making uh, also, uh, that start date is March the 29th. Um, then all of the programs uh, will all start again uh, in the fall. Um, uh, the plan is to start them in September and as we've done, uh, you know, if that needs to change, uh, we will be uh, very thoughtful uh, and safe about that and we'll share that uh, information as it needs to be. Right now, the fall start date is for September 7th um, and our extended um, uh, priority deadline is February the 1st. So everybody has until February the 1st to get all of your requirements completed, your file completed, um, and then uh, through February, uh, we will be uh, looking at all of those completed files with the admissions committee, uh, making a first round of decisions for the fall um, for uh, March the 1st. So I hope that that's helpful. Um, this information ought to be on our website um, and uh, I'm happy to talk with you about any of these details uh, as well. Okay, admissions requirements. Again, this is a, an overview. Um, I uh, am happy to take the time after this uh, with anybody individually or as a group to get into the details. Um, but in about 10 minutes, I'm gonna introduce uh, Jamie Dergay, our Director of uh, Financial Aid. Um, so admissions requirements, we have a free application, okay? So um, you can either inquire, fill out the inquiry form if you're just thinking about uh, coming in this direction for career training. Uh, but if you're in a place where you're, you feel like you're ready uh, to do this, then we encourage you to uh, begin uh, the application process by filling out that uh, application form. It is free because we believe in access. We don't wanna create any barriers at all. Uh, so please uh, fill out that application uh, if this uh, is you and, uh, and we'll be in touch with you um, uh, around all of these other requirements and uh, to have a conversation with you about what your goals are and just to try and get an understanding of, of what your candidacy is. Um, I like to put the transcripts first uh, because that's something you uh, that takes a little bit of time. You're asking someone else to do. We only need one official terminal transcript 
Uh, so reach out, whether that's high school or beyond, um, uh, and order that. It can come in electronically or uh, by physical mail uh, and have it sent to the school. Um, our accreditors have been very understanding and gracious. Uh, right now, we are in a place where we can take an attestation. Uh, what that means is we will take your word for it that you have graduated from high school or from beyond that. And then we'll put um, your attestation, which can be just in the form of an email, put that in your file. And uh, that is, you know, if your school right now is experiencing some challenges and accessing your official transcript to send it, um, uh, this is a way uh, that we can still uh, facilitate this process. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, we asked for two letters of recommendation. It's great to hear from you that you're interested in uh, training at North Bennett Street School. Um, we also love to hear from two people that are in your professional network uh, that are supportive of you coming in this direction. Uh, the two main things that we want to hear are, can someone speak well about your work ethic? Um, are you a hard worker? Uh, can they share maybe an example? You know, are you punctual? Um, uh, those things are very important here. And I just want to share that these do not have to be uh, a direct match. If you're applying for uh, piano technology, it does not have to be from a technician. Uh, it can be from a teacher, a guidance counselor, a coach, uh, a supervisor, past and present. Um, and that's very helpful. So, so the two things we're looking for are something about your work ethic uh, that is positive. And, uh, and then also, does this person believe that this career pathway is a good fit for you? Uh, so those are the two things that we look for. It doesn't have to be a biopic, uh, and there's a there's a form um, that's that's available for you to share uh, with the people that will um, write your recommendation. Okay, so those those two items are things you're asking other people to do. Uh, the rest of this um, we ask you to do, and you can also think of uh, these requirements as a project that we're asking you to manage. So our admissions team, uh, we're, you know, we're a pretty small team. We're not going to be um, uh, calling you and emailing you after every one of these things uh, to get you to do this. We want, we want to see evidence of your self-motivation in wanting to come here. We're looking for people that are self-motivated and self-reliant. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we ask you uh, for all of these items uh, and for you to demonstrate uh, uh, those qualities. We ask for a lot of things because we want to get a kaleidoscopic view of your candidacy. Uh, you know, some people that will really thrive in an academic environment, um, uh, that translates well here. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, sometimes people don't thrive in an academic uh, environment, but yet they're, they're really excellent at hands-on. So each one of these components um, is an opportunity to see uh, a different face of uh, the diamond uh, that is your candidacy for wanting to come uh, to North Bennett Street School. So I hope that that is helpful to share. Uh, we ask for you uh, to write a one-page statement of purpose. Please tell us in your words uh, why you want to come and, and what your goals are. Um, and then we ask for a resume. We are a career school. We're always looking for direct and transferable skills. Um, and a resume is a great way to see that. Uh, if you have done some things uh, like go to a place like Penland to take a class or uh, if you've you know, helped a, a family member do demolition on a deck and rebuild that, add those things in. We love to see those things. Um, uh, we also uh, will interview you. Uh, we will have a conversation with you on a phone or video. And then some programs uh, require 
uh, a conversation with candidates as well. Um, there are a few programs uh, that require a portfolio. Um, those are book binding, cabinet and furniture making, um, uh, and jewelry making and repair. Uh, so we wanna see uh, visual evidence uh, that you have some experience uh, that shows uh, that you have uh, attention to detail, quality, uh, mechanical aptitude, hand skills. Uh, and then also we're right now we're, we've suspended the hand skill test because those have been in person, uh, but they've been a really great addition over the last two years uh, in a number of programs, locksmithing, jewelry making and repair, carpentry, preservation carpentry, um, uh, we are looking for ways to deliver this in a virtual format. Uh, and while it won't be a requirement uh, for the fall, um, we will be looking to uh, bring those on board as an alternate uh, for people that live very far away uh, for the fall of 2022. Um, now, with all of these things together, we'll sit down with an admissions committee and uh, this is essentially your candidacy is, is a way to showcase all of these different things uh, with the committee, which consists of uh, the admissions team here uh, and then with faculty and other staff members. Um, and we'll go through that process. We'll try and identify uh, uh, candidates that uh, have the, uh, the best potential to be successful here and then to continue the great reputation um, that North Bennett Street School has uh, within the industries that we, that we train for. Um, and then I'm just gonna leave this up here for a minute. Um, please uh, reach out to us as I've, uh, as I've uh, offered. Um, our team is here. We like to meet people where they are. Um, we wanna answer all of your questions. It's in fact our job. Uh, about North Bennett Street School, the admissions process, uh, financial aid, the programs, uh, outcomes. And uh, I appreciate everybody taking time uh, out of your day uh, to join us here. Um, and uh, I will be uh, your host again uh, with my colleague, uh, Kristen Odell, uh, to show you advanced piano technology uh, in a little bit. Um, Renee Kelsey uh, will be joining us uh, to showcase her uh, Piano Technician's Toolkit and Eli Cleveland again uh, with, uh, with SketchUp. And then we'll be back tomorrow to showcase some more uh, full-time programs, uh, continuing ed classes, discussions. Uh, and again, thank you for being here uh, wherever you are. And uh, I want to introduce uh, my colleague here. We've been working together for like 10 years, right, Jamie? That's right. Uh, Jamie, Jamie Durgay, uh, everybody. Thank you, Rob. Thanks for the introduction. And uh, as uh, Rob uh, described, I, I do wear a few hats here at North Bennett Street School. I uh, don't have one on today, but uh, as well as being director of financial aid, I'm the school certifying official for veterans benefits and the SEVIS uh, 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 officer for international students who attend our school with an M1 visa. Uh, but we'll get a little bit more into that uh, in a minute. Um, we wanna take a few minutes and talk a little bit more in depth about financial aid. Um, those resources that are available to you to make your training here at North Bennett Street School a reality. I do have a, a slide presentation to share with you. Uh, so I'll pull that up. How does that look? Does everybody see that? Oh, I need to share this. This is my screen. How does that look now? Does that everybody see that okay? So uh, we're gonna go through the slide screen, keep this um, as informal as we can in a Zoom meeting, um, but please, um, if you have any questions um, in the chat room, uh, add those questions and we'll try and answer any questions that, that you have. 
some of the topics we'll talk about today, um, overview of financial aid, uh, North Bennett Street School students and diversity, um, types of aid, affordability, how to apply, and then we'll try and answer any questions that you have. Uh, in the overview, uh, we want to discuss the kinds of aid available here at North Bennett Street School um, and why we think um, training here at North Bennett Street represents a great value for career training. Uh, we understand that um, going back to school um, is a significant financial undertaking uh, and our team is here uh, to make that possible for you through the financial resources um, uh, that we can, can provide. Um, most of our students are receiving some financial aid, about 70% um, will be receiving financial aid um, during the course of their enrollment here at North Bennett Street School. Uh, and we're now on track to uh, award uh, over a million dollars in NBSS scholarships annually. Um, to, uh, to qualified students. And we're gonna be talking a lot more about that uh, in a few minutes and affordability. Um, affordability, that's uh, along with diversity are two of the themes um, that um, we're happy to, to reinforce and continue to emphasize here today. Um, uh, we've got a diverse student body. Um, they present all walks of life, ages, experience and backgrounds. Um, uh, they're recent high school graduates, uh, uh, former college students, um, and uh, professionals, even retired professionals who are uh, seeking um, a second career uh, in this stage of their life. Um, we're committed to making MBSS both uh, affordable and welcoming for students of all backgrounds. Uh, Rob discussed uh, the emphasis on diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, that we've undertaken at the school. And um, that, uh, that, that effort uh, is no small part reflected in what we're doing with, with financial aid. Um, we wanna emphasize, we wanna encourage everyone to apply for aid. Um, with the programs that we have, we believe that there's there's something of value for, for every uh, student uh, who comes to North Bend Street School, regardless of your background. Um, we've got a wide range of aid here. Um, we're fully accredited. We participate in federal uh, financial aid. Um, uh, our full-time programs are undergraduate programs. So when students enroll here, you'll receive financial aid uh, just like you would any other college or university. Uh, the first kind of aid we're gonna talk about is grants and scholarships. Um, that's gift aid, um, aid that does not have to be uh, repaid. Um, and to provide some background on scholarship at North Bend Street School, I've been here since 2010. Uh, and in 2009, uh, the year before I came on board, our scholarship budget was about 50,000 um, a year. Um, this year, we'll be awarding upwards of $650,000 in institutional scholarship. Um, so uh, that our, our commitment to scholarship has grown exponentially. And as I mentioned, we're on our way to um, um, uh, awarding uh, upwards of a million dollars per year. Um, that growth is um, uh, in, in large part to um, uh, major commitment to a uh, scholarship endowment uh, capital campaign uh, that the school undertook. Um, and we've raised about $20 million uh, for scholarship endowment. Um, and uh, the other thing that I want to um, emphasize on the bottom of this slide here is private scholarship. Um, we want to encourage you to conduct your own private scholarship search. 
Um, there's a list, um, a fairly uh, exhaustive list uh, of private scholarships uh, that you can find on our uh, financial aid uh, page on our website. Uh, many of these scholarship students have uh, brought with them uh, to, um, to North Bennett Street School, and that's how they've come to our attention. Uh, oftentimes, they're small in nature, um, 1,000 a year, 1,500 a year, uh, but I've seen students pull together two or three of these scholarships, and it can become an important part of your financing plan. Um, just to, to mention the Mike Rowe Foundation scholarship in particular, uh, they have been uh, very generous to, to us uh, and to our students in, the, in recent years. Um, you can find the link to apply for, for that foundation scholarship on our website, but they, their scholarships, in fact, um, they've supported our students upwards of $10,000 a year. So, um, you know, they, they can, be, can be significant. Second type of aid, loans. Loans are money that you uh, borrow, have to be repaid with, with interest. Um, our uh, major loan program is the Federal Direct Loan Program. Um, your uh, eligibility um, by completing a FAFSA online, uh, as I mentioned, our full-time programs are undergraduate programs. So uh, student loans are awarded at the undergraduate level. Um, even though a uh, common question is, you know, students that come to us with a bachelor's degree, um, you know, they imagine that they may receive student loans as graduate students or master's degree seeking students. Our students, our programs are undergraduate. So um, when you receive your offer of financial aid award, you'll see a loan amount um, that's at that first year undergraduate level, even if you have a bachelor's degree. Um, but uh, if that uh, uh, loan amount um, is not enough to, to uh, or if you would need additional financing beyond the amount that's made available to you, um, there is additional loans available, the Federal Parent PLUS loan for students under the age of 24, um, as well as private lenders. Um, both of those programs can be utilized up to the full cost of attendance. Um, if you need it. Uh, loans, we, you know, because they do have to be repaid with interest, we want to minimize the role of loans as much as possible um, to uh, minimize your long-term expense of your program. Um, but they are a resource that's available. And there are times when um, uh, specifically um, on the federal student loan side, um, that, that amount um, is both manageable and um, the piece that helps uh, make it possible to attend. Third, we want to mention VA benefits. Um, as I mentioned, I'm the school certifying official uh, for North Bennett Street School. Uh, in recent history, uh, veteran enrollment here has, has been as high as 20% of the student body. Um, so veterans benefits are uh, cent central to veteran success. Um, to uh, apply for aid, you'll you'll want to um, go to the GI Bill website um, and uh, ap apply for your educational benefits ahead of time. Um, uh, they may be most likely the program that you would be utilizing would be uh, post 9-11 GI Bill, Bill benefits or uh, voc rehab benefits. Um, uh, those are the, the primary. We also do have um, um, uh, dependent and survivors benefits um, through the VA uh, that students have used, but the, the major ones are post 9-11 and voc rehab. Um, and uh, so the, the major point I want to make in incorporating uh, VA benefits into a discussion of financial aid is that we still want you to apply for financial aid, uh, even if you're going to be um, using your post 9-11 or voc rehab and you say, gee, those, those benefits that, that I've earned through, through my service are going to cover my tuition in full or almost all of my tuition, so I'm not going to apply for financial aid. Um, we want to encourage all veterans uh, to apply for financial aid as well, uh, complete the FAFSA, uh, because um, you will be eligible for some of that, um, or if you are eligible for some of that grant uh, money, that scholarship money, that free money, um, 
we don't want you to miss out on the opportunity to to uh, take advantage of that. Um, there's nothing in your in your um, VA education benefits that prevent you from re receiving anything that you qualify for um, on the financial aid side. Um, we just need to have you do an application. Um, and I will mention uh, here and also talk about it again in another slide that um, North Ministry School has uh, uh, developed uh, what we call our North Ministry School Yellow Ribbon Scholarship. So that is an annual scholarship that is awarded to uh, all veterans enrolling in one of our full time programs. Affordability training at North Bennett Street School is, uh, we believe, more affordable now than ever before. Um, that's due to our commitment to scholarship. Our, we've frozen tuition uh, for uh, uh, current and uh, future years of enrollment and our commitment to diversity. Uh, some data on affordability here on this uh, slide. Uh, as I say, about 70% of our students are receiving uh, financial aid in some form. Uh, we'll be awarding $650,000 in scholarship aid uh, this year. Intuition is frozen at current levels. The, the level of affordability that we uh, are able to achieve uh, really has been reached through um, unique and innovative scholarship programs that we've developed here at North Bennett Street School. Um, the first is Pell Yes. Um, many of our students come to us with a bachelor's degree. Um, and um, the Pell Yes program that we um, developed um, allows those students to access um, the uh, value of a federal Pell Grant um, if they have a bachelor's degree. As some of you may know, the Department of Education limits the federal uh, Pell Grant to um, non-degree holders. So um, we found that um, those students coming to us with a degree, um, they, were, they were not able to access that uh, federal Pell and we wanted to um, be able to step in and, uh, and um, offer a way to, um, to meet that need uh, that we saw uh, with our students. The second, our North Ministry School Workforce Initiative Scholarship. Uh, these are full cost uh, scholarships for students in the greater Boston area. Um, and they'll cover tuition tools, uh, local transportation, and uh, they're intended specifically to um, support high need students in, in the Boston area uh, who experience barriers to employment uh, and represents our uh, commitment to diversity and to the community that we, that we live in. Uh, the third is the MBS Yellow Ribbon, which I spoke, uh, mentioned just a moment ago. Um, that's for all veterans uh, enrolling in one of our full-time program. Uh, it's an annual award currently made at, uh, uh, at uh, $1,600 per year. Um, and so that would be for veterans in any year of enrollment in one of our full-time programs. Um, so what, what you can see from, from these scholarship programs that we've created is um, that North Bend Street School is really um, tried to be innovative and um, step in where traditional financial aid and benefit programs have left a gap for the students that were coming to us and presented challenges to their enrollment. And uh, hopefully through these, uh, these programs, we're able to um, step in and meet that need. Um, your financing plan, um, it, it, it's going to be as unique um, and diverse as the students who are enrolling. Um, it's often going to be, it's often going to include multiple components, um, financial aid offered through our office, scholarships, grants, student loans, as well as perhaps um, personal savings, 
um, state unemployment or rehabilitation benefits, uh, AmeriCorps benefits, if you're a student who's coming from that background, uh, even part-time employment uh, during the course of the school year is not uncommon. Um, so what we do is we, the goal is to uh, sort of collect these different resources and put them into a plan that makes it uh, feasible for you to come and achieve your training here at North Bennett Street School. Uh, like all aspects of your relationship with North Bennett Street School, um, the financing process and financial aid is a partnership um, and it works best when we, we work together. Uh, we keep the lines of communication open. Um, so please um, contact me, contact me directly, uh, communicate with us on um, the challenges that you're having um, so that we can address those uh, individual needs and, and make it happen for you. Applying for financial aid. Complete a FAFSA. That's the. Uh, it's a one-step process. Um, go to uh, fafsa.gov. F-A-F-S-A.gov. With uh, 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 you'll use the North Bennett Street School uh, school code 015527, and by entering that school code on your FAFSA, the Department of Ed will share your FAFSA results with us so that we can review that FAFSA. Um, uh, determine your financial aid eligibility or follow up with you if any additional information is needed uh, in order to provide you with a financial aid uh, offer. Um, you wouldn't want to, you can begin thinking about applying uh, for financial aid at the same time that you're applying for admissions. Uh, they're kind of a dual track um, process, admissions and financial aid. Uh, the goal is to be able to provide you with an offer of financial aid at the same time that we offer you admission to the school. So the sooner you complete your FAFSA and any additional request steps that you receive from me in the financial aid office, uh, the sooner we'll be able to share um, financial aid eligibility information with you. Um, in the meantime, I do want to point out uh, a tool on our website and encourage you to take a look at our net price calculator, uh, which you can find on our uh, financial aid page of our website. Net price calculator is a uh, it's a tool that's been around for um, since the Obama administration. Um, the Obama administration it mandated that this tool be utilized by all uh, colleges and universities as a uh, way to provide cost transparency for uh, prospective students uh, so that they understood the true uh, cost of uh, their education or their training. Uh, so if you uh, took the time, took a few minutes uh, to go use the, the net price calculator. Um, what you're get, what's going to provide you is a very, uh, actually very accurate uh, uh, picture of what your financial aid eligibility and your out-of-pocket expenses are going to be uh, for your program at North Bennett Street School. Um, and anyone uh, taking the time to do that, um, I'm happy to talk to you about the results that you see. Um, so uh, we can go over that. Um, tell you what it means, answer any questions you have about it, and, um, and then we can start to address the, um, the gap or the out-of-pocket expense that, it, that might indicate um, so that you're prepared to start your program and have your financing uh, uh, plan in place. Um, I want to pause there um, and See if anybody has any questions um, that I could answer. Um, I also want to scroll ahead a, a little bit uh, to my contact information. Uh, so um, please email me, please call. Um, I really want to have a conversation with you um, to answer any questions. Um, for those of you going through the financial aid process for the first time, um, it can be a little bit confusing, um, but I assure you that uh, you'll um, become an expert after your, your uh, first year and working with, with me and the admissions team uh, on all of that. So um, 
uh, please do uh, email or call uh, so that we can have those conversations. Full scholarships. So yes, our full scholarships would be the um, the workforce scholarship that I um, that I spoke about uh, in one of the previous slides. And um, it's right now that is a scholarship that's available to um, students in the greater Boston area. Uh, the way to apply is the same as applying for other scholarships, complete a FAFSA, and. Um, when we, we will be working with the admissions office during the admissions process to identify candidates um, who may qualify for this workforce uh, initiative scholarship. And we'll let you know um, whether we need any more information uh, from you um, as that process um, unfolds. Um, I do wanna say that um, financial aid packages in general though, because of our commitment to uh, scholarship, they are, um, generally in the area of uh, 25 to 50 percent of the cost of tuition. So um, the process is worthwhile, the application is worthwhile, and the support is there. Sure, thanks. Question about yellow ribbon. So um, it's important to make a distinction between our North Bennett Street School Yellow Ribbon Scholarship and the VA's Yellow Ribbon Scholarship. Um, North Bennett Street School, we're a non-degree granting institution. Um, so we're not actually able to participate in the VA's Yellow Ribbon Program, but because we saw uh, that this need existed, um, we um, have created the North Bennett Street School Yellow Ribbon uh, Scholarship Program. Um, not affiliated with the VA, but all veterans enrolling in our full-time program will receive, um, just by virtue of enrolling, um, a Yellow Ribbon Scholarship, uh, and, which is an annual award currently made at uh, $1,600 per year. Question about the FAFSA and uh, completing the FAFSA if you've already got a bachelor's degree. That's a good question. Um, when you do your FAFSA, you're going to see a question on there that asks you for your year and grade level of enrollment in the upcoming school year. If you've already been to college or if you already have a bachelor's degree or an associate's degree, you're gonna to wanna to answer uh, first year uh, undergraduate um, who's attended college previously. Um, and that is because uh, our programs are undergraduate programs. So um, if you're going back to school, if you've, if you've received your degree and you're returning uh, to us here at North Bennett Street School, you're gonna be an undergraduate student again. So you wanna answer that you'll be an undergraduate who's attended school previously. Thank you. Any other questions? If a, if a dependent of a veteran is enrolling in, in our program, we would want them to apply for financial aid so that we could qualify them for, for a scholarship or financial aid like any other student. Um, it may be that the dependent also will be, uh, the veteran will be transferring their uh, education benefits to um, their dependent to use um, for their training here at school. So uh, that that might be happening, um, and but, the dependent should also apply for financial aid so that we can qualify uh, that person for for uh, scholarship uh, in their own right.
Our scholarships are primarily need-based. Um, just received a question about scholarship for um, uh, special needs or uh, individuals with uh, disabilities. Um, so uh, they're through uh, the generosity of the of our our current youth scholarship donors. Um, they uh, we may, there may be scholarships that are um, identified for students. Um, um, that um, of certain backgrounds um, based on the goal of the donor um, to support. Um, but even in those cases, they're going to be the qualification, is, the need-based component of the application for financial aid is still gonna be considered. So, um, you know, if you're in that situation, I still would encourage you to do the FAFSA. Um, let's, you know, I always say, let's get the results first and see see what the FAFSA is is indicating, and then um, let's go from there. Thanks for the question. Uh, work study. We North Bend School does not participate in the federal work study program. However, there are student employment opportunities uh, on campus uh, in the building. Um, and students will learn, uh, there'll be an opportunity to learn about um, employment in the building um, uh, after you arrive uh, and begin your enrollment. Um, Brian McGrath, who is our Director of uh, Career Life and Student Services, he'll be a resource for you on uh, student employment in the building. Um, it's not uncommon for our students to be working part-time uh, as well uh, off campus. Um, and uh, for housing, uh, as I say, the uh, housing costs, um, uh, alternative uh, loan uh, providers and the Parent PLUS loan, uh, financing is available to cover those costs if you're not receiving, if the, the financial aid award offer that you receive um, through the North Bennett Street School Financial Aid Office, um, is not such that it's going to cover the cost of your of your housing. There is those additional financing resources: Parent Plus loan for students under the age of 24, and uh, alternative student loan lenders. Um, uh, two such lenders that um, our students have been using in recent years are Sally May, uh, SallyMay.com, and Wells Fargo at WellsFargo.com. Uh, each of those uh, lenders uh, offers a uh, a career a career school loan. Um, uh, which can be used to, to finance costs of uh, living expenses while you're, while you're enrolled as a full-time student here. Yes, I will share my uh, screen again and my contact information. J. Durgay at nbss.edu. My office phone is 617-227-0155, extension 115. And uh, because a lot of us are working remotely now, um, as you know, because of COVID, please feel free to reach out to my, uh, call me on my cell phone, 617-697-1910. Uh, Thank you all very much. I hope this session was informative. Um, and um, please do reach out to me uh, so that we can continue the conversation. Hey, everybody. Uh, thank you, Jamie Dergay, our Director of Financial Aid. Uh, if you're just joining us, uh, welcome. Uh, we are actually right where we started this morning outside of cabinet and furniture making and advanced piano technology. Uh, we're about to go into uh, advanced piano technology and, uh, and see what they're doing there. Um, but before we go in, uh, I just wanted to say thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, this is a lot of fun and uh, you know we've all missed being in the building. And so just walking around and seeing this work uh, is so energizing. And I hope that it translates to you at home 
uh, what people are doing, uh, the care, the attention, and the love uh, around learning and in making and repairing things here uh, is just fantastic. And we're so glad to be able to share this with you. And we're glad that you're joining us uh, as well. Uh, later on today, uh, Renee Kelsey will be uh, giving a continuing ed demonstration about her piano technology toolkit. Uh, and then after that, uh, Eli Cleveland is going to be uh, giving a free class on SketchUp. So I hope you can join us uh, for those. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for, for being here. Uh, this is really cool. Um, so Kristen and I are gonna bring you into Advanced Piano right now. I'm just gonna switch my camera view. And uh, let's see, there we go. Hey, Lewis. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Thank you, Krista. Hi. Oh, thank you. What's going on in here? We got a whole bunch of stuff. We're in pedal land these days, working on pedal, piano pedals in the trap work, uh, and working on taking these pianos apart and reassembling them, rebuilding them. Uh, we got two projects going on right now. We'll pepper in another one later in the year, and then probably two more after that. So. So um, tell us your position in here, and then I also want to know that Debbie is on again on screen on the webinar, so she's up there as well. So mm -hmm. hi to Debbie, she's answering questions. Hey Debbie. <laughs> hey Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm uh, an instructor in the advanced piano program. Uh, so we're, we pick up where the first year left, left off and take it from there in tuning, regulation, repair. And um, also we do uh, focusing on, most of our time here is focused on rebuilding grand pianos. So, cool. so yeah, so we're right. gonna look around. Yeah. Uh, let's see, yeah. Um, we got a lot, like I said, a lot of people working on pedal stuff today. Um, and we're gonna get, later in the year, we'll get into more of the heavy rebuilding, mm -hmm. which is, uh, you know, things like replacing soundboards or replacing pin blocks. And we have just a couple of examples out here. Um, and maybe we'll talk about that stuff and then we'll go talk to students and see what they're up to. Sure. Uh, so we have a few sort of, um, you know, uh, pretty big uh, clamping calls, things like that, that are done, that are made specifically for rebuilding purposes. Uh, this is a bridge press. So anytime you need to take a soundboard, this is a, a piano in progress. Anytime we need to do any clamping operations to the bridge itself, um, then something like this comes in handy. So this is the soundboard as a whole, which we saw the demo of the music box yes. in PT and uh, piano technology earlier, if anybody was here for that. Yeah, and so part of the program is to replace soundboards um, and uh, putting on new bridge caps is part of that. So there, if you can see, I don't know if you can zoom in to see, this is two pieces. We have the darker original piece of wood and then the cap up here is a new piece that will re glue a new piece on and that uh, lets us you know, reset the, the height of the bridge and all kinds of stuff that has to be on. So we do that, uh, any of that stuff happens here um, and it's uh, a pneumatic press. And I'll go ahead and put, some, put one on here. Is this something that you built? This is uh, David Betts built. Oh yes. Yeah. Um, and so, take this and put it anywhere. We got magnets here. We got some sheet metal up here and we can get this clamp anywhere that it'll reach from this tube here. Uh, get where we want it to go. And Those are just to protect the wood? They uh, help distribute the clamping pressure and they give us a little more rise, a little more, you know, a little, a little longer throw on it. Mm -hmm. um, and they do definitely protect the wood. This is approaching at about 40 PSI now, but we run it much higher actual blue joint so it's uh it's there's a lot of pressure on this mm -hmm. so, yeah so we just learned earlier that what is it 20 tons of pressure is in in the strings or in the yeah uh pressure on the soundboard and there's a yeah. lot of ways to slice that up linear pressure how much it's pressing down uh in different scale different pianos have variations on that and that's very much part of what the piano sounds like at the time um you know Yamaha might have a different design than Steinway, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a big part of it. Um, so, uh, you know, that's 
that's it's part just of it. volatile, yeah. like it could just, you know. It's a lot of, yeah, it's a lot. And it's very interesting that, you know, I mean, pianos from the moment you string them, they're pulling themselves apart. Mm -hmm. So all, you know, everything has to be really, really nicely done, fit together really well. Uh, but they are uh, self-destructive <laughs> <laughs> instruments uh, and they have a, a definite lifespan. Yeah. Uh, even if they're not playing, even if they're well taken care of, they have a lifespan. And then for this press here, uh, the gray valves here, does that allow you to control some of the pressure? It's on or off. Okay. Yeah, and you can open them up nice and slow. That's the idea. So it doesn't go bang down. All right. Of a sudden. And then they're color coded just so you can track everything. And yeah, it's pretty confusing if you didn't know which one you're opening and closing at different times. So, so yeah, that's something that, uh, you know, those are pretty loose at 40 psi. But yeah. Um, and you know, we, we, this is just a mock up. Uh, this is just a piece of pine, not what we use for bridge material. This sure. Show. This is a soundboard that didn't make it into a piano. Uh, and you know, what, you can also look here, this whole thing is curved this way, so it imparts crown oh, yeah. the system here. I see that. Yeah. And the ribs that go in this direction are also curved that way, so it imparts crown in two directions. Huh. So you end up with this thing that is a very strange shape that we glue into the case. Mm -hmm. And then it starts to act like it's supposed to be. Oh, wow. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 It's something that every rebuilder or most technicians, when there's no strings and they're played in the piano, we love to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, does it mean anything? I, I don't know. <laughs> it sounds like a note. I think you could yeah. match the note to whatever oh, that yeah. is. It's like a drum. You know? What is the soundboard? This is a uh, spruce. Uh, very, there's various types of spruce that are used, mm -hmm. but it's generally going to be some kind of spruce. Yeah. So, and it's quarter sawn. The cut of wood needs to be quarter sawn. Uh, so you see these lines here, vertical grain on the end, mm -hmm. um, that sort of thing. And we, we get these from um, mostly from a guy up in Lowell who's putting together. Uh, we'll buy panels from him. And if you look on the other side. Oh. Around. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is the root structure that supports the crown and supports the soundboard and the string tension. And we'll get those from basically the same source. Wow. There's lots of places to get them. It's going to be interesting to see rib structure in violin making tomorrow. The word that they call something a rib that we would call the rim. Oh. So, huh. So oh, yeah, because the rib structure is the shape yeah. on the inside. Yeah. Yeah. And so they have, you know, all kinds of different things that do support that, that do sort of the same job. Mm -hmm. uh, but they call them things like uh, like face bars and sound posts and stuff mm -hmm. like that, you know. But we, it's, they, you know. They also use spruce, too. They do, yeah. Spruce. I feel like the in between the programs, each one of the industries has its own language. Uh, so as you just mentioned, it's kind of fascinating. Um, that you know, there could be the same thing, but industry or program, it's a completely different word. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and a lot of stuff shop to shop is going to be a different term, also. Yeah, you know, there's just a lot of uh, just personalized uh, language that comes in this trade. So, you know, different areas, different people will say different things. Mm -hmm. but yeah, so this is a shop, so there's sound going on. <laughs> yeah, should we cut it? Hey, Jonathan. Can we hold off on that for now? Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, this is the bottom of the piano, something a lot of people don't get to see. So yeah. It'd be nice to have it, have it out. Uh, this is a private project, but it's very much in line with what we do with students. So. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing people often don't get to see is the bottom of the plate. So if we look, oh, at, this? Yeah, if we look at this this piece over this piano on its feet, this gold thing, a lot of folks call that the harp, but technicians call it the plate. Uh, it's made out of cast iron. It is, you know, all that tension we were talking about. This is why that can happen. It holds, it holds all that tension and keeps things from uh, folding in half or imploding or whatever you might, whatever you might want to imagine that happens. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very, you know, very structured, uh, structural body. And this is the bottom of it. Um, this is this plate goes to this piano that we just looked at the soundboard on. Uh, it's a Stanley M. And uh, part of this job is to get a new pin block, which is this piece right here. You can see we painted it gold as part of uh, other other operations, <laughs> painting the plates on other pianos. I love how the underside is never finished. It's like only ironing the front. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, you can see this is painted just enough to hide. Yeah. Right. And usually, uh, you'll see a signature. This said, this just says signway, and then the part numbers. Uh, I'm sorry, the serial number for this piano. But a lot of times, you'll see the signature of someone from the foundry or something. And, you know, this really cool, fancy, curly cued signature. Mm. That's their maker's mark in a way. Yeah, yeah, and it's just in chalk, but it stays there. You know. It stays there because nobody's ever under it, you know. Yeah. I tend to, I tend to leave them there too. I don't, I don't see why I want to clean that off. No. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that fascinates me about these about pianos is the asymmetry. There's always something asymmetrical happening, mm -hmm. like this um, pinboard that mm -hmm. was, yeah. Pin block, yeah. Pin block. Yeah. It's not. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's a very odd shape. A lot of odd shapes. Uh, there's not a lot that's square and perfectly straight in pianos. The mechanisms need to be running very true uh, but that's more you know how, how a machine would function very very true and in the woodworking sense a lot of it is just off 90 degrees or you know just barely not square mm -hmm. um, so we do need squares we need straight edges but it's all based on um, you know the things that need to be straight are say the string for example that ends up being straight and all these other things uh they're sort of uh, at the mercy of that happening, you know? Right. I mean, I'm just noticing this. It's yep. sloped, so you have to you chisel that to yeah. fit that, right? Yeah, exactly. So this needs to fit this very nicely, and it slopes up. It also has a lot of topography this way, mm -hmm. and this flange here is never, uh, you know, <laughs> as much as I can say the word never, it's never straight. <laughs> um, and it's, you know, it has a notch that helps us look at things. And, yeah. But, you know, look at this and see if it's rocking so there's a clear amount of rock there rock side to side vertically like that mm -hmm. uh and it's you know it's uh personally it's one of my favorite things to do is fit a pin block it's just this very uh abstract thinking you know it's not you know, there's no there's no real recipe for it you just have to see what what's there and make it fit and yeah. it's just this really nice uh sort of uh free-form process uh mm -hmm. it's not very intellectual once you get the idea it's it's sculpture really you know yeah, uh, yeah. It's sort of subtractive sculpture and then it's fundamental to everything else uh yeah. in order to get to that beautiful sound at the end yeah this holds the tension of all the strings right we have a lot of tension and we have metal versus wood metal's always going to win and this is the wood this is going to lose right so eventually the pin block is going to fail on virtually any piano out there and um, it's just gonna, yeah, it's gonna need replacing. Quickly, how does it fail? Where does it fail? It's the, the holes themselves. There's a, there, there's a steel pin that would be stuck out, mm -hmm. sticking out of here, like we got here. And the string is pulling on it and the string tension just pulls on it until it, it just it's opens just gonna up the hole. It's just gonna split that hole? Yep. Well. Yeah, and it just opens up. There's a lot of specific ways they might fail, but one way or Again, another. with the violence. Yeah. yeah, one way or another, this is gonna this is gonna let go eventually, and it, it has nothing to do with musicality. It's not, you know, the piano may sound great, but if you can't tune it, if it can't be tuned, it's not a piano anymore. So that's cool. when when they need to be replaced. So. Lewis, so we're we're here with a, a live audience, uh, and, and and they have an opportunity to ask questions and things. Uh, I know Debbie is there um, answering some questions. One question uh, that that uh, I hear a lot is, you know, what are the outcomes? Uh, what kind of careers uh, do people get once they graduate from advanced piano technology, and how does that differ from basic piano technology? Yeah, it's it's um, you know a lot of our graduates uh, go on to work for themselves, uh, and what they do as advanced graduates versus beginning graduates might differ. If you, especially if you're going to work for yourself, um, the experience here might let you more be more confident to take a take a job uh to offer a service to uh you know to to just work on a, a different level uh than you would if you were a first year graduate and as a first year graduate a lot of people go and work for other folks and and find a wing to get under which we say everybody should first year or second year find yourself a wing um, right and you know uh get somebody to help you out that you can also help uh, but Things that you might only do under a wing, you might be more willing to do uh, do on your own as a as a second year graduate. Um, a lot of a lot of uh, higher level entry level positions, like working for universities, uh, are are more available often to second year graduates. Um, a lot of uh, 
physicians working for dealerships or manufacturers, uh, oftentimes they like to, to know that you've seen and handled the inside of an instrument and you've got this language. A lot of it um, can't be taught in two years, but one of the big things that I, I try to do is uh, share the language, uh, more of the language of it. So whether it's analyzing the balance and the touch of a keyboard, um, second year graduates aren't gonna be experts at that, but they should be able to have that conversation with whoever they might meet. Um, String scaling, again, not gonna be experts, but you should have that language, have that resource. Um, and so a lot of it is where you're starting from when, you're, when you go out into the field and, and what kind of conversations and how helpful you can be to the customers that you meet and the technicians in the area too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is this, to tell me if I'm wrong or, or if I'm misspeaking, is the steel plate one of the only things that you don't have your hands on in this program? We, we making them. Yeah, we're, we're not making the case. We're not making the plate and we're not making the key sets. Um, and basically, you know, other than that, we're replacing a lot of it. We're not making the action parts, but we modify them and fit them to the to, to each piano. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, and there's a lot of interaction with our suppliers and, and things like that. You really have to know your stuff to talk to them and, and let them know what you need. Um, but, you know, the things in rebuilding that we don't replace are the rim, the plate, and uh, more and more so, you know, we are replacing key sets, but for the most part, it's still standard to not replace a key set. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And you have a spray booth, so what are you spraying in there? Yeah, the, mo the, the most common thing that we spray is the cast iron plate. Okay. That's the reason, really, we need the, the booth. We do refinish small parts, uh, and if you look in there, we've got... Uh, some metal trap work parts that would be screwed to the bottom of the piano that activate the pedals uh, or allow the pedals to work. Uh, and some of those parts will spray also. Very handy for us to have that. Uh, also other places, other parts of the school cabinet furniture yeah. use it and yeah. carpentry use it and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. so it's, great. Uh, it's, you know, the, the plate is the reason we need it, but I don't mind having it. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> it's and do you like sandblast the plate? And we do all the prep by hand. Okay. So a lot of sanding, hand sanding, um, and you know filler like bondo and stuff like that. You know, there's all kinds of spot fillers and putties that we use. Uh, it's very much uh, auto body repair. <laughs> that was the theme in basic piano technology. Was a lot, a lot of things like that. Yeah, it's. it's oh, dental picks. That's what yeah. we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, we love dental yeah. picks around here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you just mentioned, you know, the other other industry products. I love looking at these, these the I beams. Is that what they're called? The help, the um. This yeah. What are yeah. those called? That's LBL. L oh, yeah. aren't those the beams yeah. they use in construction? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. David made this by hand, and I and uh, I can't remember all the details, but I I think that he saw it somewhere. Yeah. And then thought, okay, let me. Let me make one of these. Yeah, it's really similar to what they use at the Mason and Hamlin factory up in Haverhill. Great. Uh, they use the same make of, of, uh, of clamps. Um, and, you know, the, the folks up there are, uh, you know, they're pretty close with the school and we were able to, I'm, I'm sure he talked to them a lot mm -hmm. in the process to see, you know, hey, what do you use for this and what do you use for that? And, and they're, they're, they're around, nice folks to know. I, it's just such a great example of the creativity in this whole building when you know when you need a material even if it's not within your industry mm -hmm. you know what you need and you just use it yeah so something yeah. that is not necessarily piano uh-huh yeah and that's one of the things that i i often say and think is that if you can make a piano shop you can rebuild a piano okay. you know? <laughs> uh, if you can do all the stuff to put a shop together nicely and make everything work then rebuilding the piano is part of it. It's in that skill set. So uh, this is definitely next level. <laughs> so, yeah. That's great. Yeah. So, great. So, maybe we can walk around and see what folks are doing. Yeah, let's do that. And if everybody, uh, if you're just joining us, we're in advanced piano technology. Uh, it's a, a nine month program uh, that trains people in rebuilding uh, and then builds on a lot of the education that uh, most students might get in basic piano technology around uh around tuning and regulation and repair so we got claire here working on some pedals hi claire hey claire hey how's it got going on yeah 
Uh, so we've disassembled this pedal wire, which is what goes on the bottom of the piano and holds all these pedals in place. And right now I'm working on removing these really old and worn bushings um, because these are just cracking off. Um, they're sort of noisy. Um, this can cause problems. So they're a little bit hard to get out. Um, they're not coming out intact, but they're just a part of the way after the place. Um, after that, we have polished this, um, the pedal pitted rod, the pedals move back and forth on. Um, we place these old and worn out parts of new ones, um, just polish and clean it up and make it work better. Nice. And what are those bushings made out of? Some kind of rubber or plastic or something? Yeah, these are old rubber. We're going to replace them um, with XA, which is a, a leather substitute, and um, a claw punching on the bottom so they make less noise. Mm -hmm. Nice. That's great. Let's see what Sam's got. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I am uh, in the process of popping the capstans on top of the keys. And, what is it called again? Uh, the capstan? Capstan. Like, like on a ship. Like a pirate ship, you know, the thing yeah. that they push. Yeah, like on a pirate ship. Yes. Yeah. Like on, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've seen those yeah. on the pirate ship. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, I put a buffing compound on the buffing wheel. And then Wow, it's kind of great. Yeah, and uh, you can see a before and after here if you'd like. These are the ones that are already done, and these are the ones that I have yet to go. Wow, what is the buffing compound made of? Uh, magical grit. Oh, yeah. is that a trademark? Thing? That is, yeah. 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 <laughs> so you can go down to jewelry and ask them all about that. Oh, that's there. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so after that, we'll polish them also just for an added bit of smoothness. And uh, yeah. And so are those, those are visible in the instrument. So that's why they need to be shiny. That's... No, they are, um, they're hidden a bit. There, so the this is basically all you see at the right. front of the keyboard, and the reason why we want these to be nice and smooth is because they contact um, the bottom of the whipin, which it, it supports everything else that, all the way up through the hammer. So a really good contact point that doesn't have any burrs or anything gritty or anything on it is really ideal to make everything run super smooth. So it's technical, and it's just aesthetically pleasing because it's, yeah. Yeah. it's a it's yeah. a mechanical benefit that we get it's pretty we, it is so pretty we're trying to lower the friction of the whole system there's right. a certain amount of friction you want in the piano action um, but it's all built on everything being nice clean smooth shiny and so when you get it back to that you tend to not need much goops and gunks and lubricants and things like that mm -hmm. which are you know part of a technician's toolkit for sure but uh when we get the chance to just start fresh start clean everything's nice and smooth then you're given a, a nice start to everything and uh, you know eventually pianos get old again but you know giving it a nice friction, low friction start that's the way to go i have a uh, trick question yeah is there any part of the piano that is meant to be gunky and filthy and stays that way? No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, absolutes, I don't like having to answer absolutes, but I, I think no. Okay. <laughs> it's not like, a, you know, we have, we, you know, we work on our machines, table saws, joiners, planers, all these machines, sort of traditional machines, and there might be oil or grease or something mm -hmm. in those, but in a piano, um, we do use lubricants on the road, you know, when we're servicing a piano on site, uh, and it's a good thing to do, but ideally everything is is clean and dry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah All right. Uh, yeah, those aren't boats. <laughs> Shouldn't be wet. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Of course. Hi, how are you? Okay. How's, How's it going? going to your bench space here. Yes. No, fine. That's great. Why well, just I'm taking apart some trap work, which is all the hidden stuff underneath the piano, all the pedals. So part of the rebuild that we're doing, and I'm just kind of 
scuffing up these to be repainted. This to be repainted, it's all going to be sanded and buffed, so it's super shiny and uh, moves really well. Um, is this an example of something you would put in the spray booth because it's metal? Yep. This is something, this is actually Tiffany's doing the same part in the booth right now. Mm. Uh, yeah, you guys can see one hanging to dry actually. Um, and then this is, uh, this will be replaced as well. So, and these are the bolts that we just, no one's doing it right now, I don't yeah. think, but uh, these are the bolts that we just refinished. So, oh. they get all rusty. So, Lewis just showed us this amazing trick where you put it in a drill press and you lay it down very gently on some 220 grit paper. And then, uh, what is it, three? We went up to 320. Yeah. 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 And uh, it just, it's amazing. They just turn brand new. <laughs> so, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Is that nice what Jonathan's doing? That's what Jonathan's doing. Yeah, we can check on him too. Nice. Yeah. yeah. So, what does this one do? What is this particular pedal? Oh, this is the shift pedal. So, this moves the whole action over um, for a voicing usually. So, it's a different sound. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, the, it's the left pedal on most pianos. I've never understood what the different, I mean, I've, I've played cello and I've played with pianos before, but I've never understood what the, the pedals do. Right. You mean, right. are they mutes? Um, no, so this one, let's go over this piano and look at it. Yeah. Tom, you can take it away still. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> These are not meant to be gone to be yeah. <laughs> So here we have uh, these are the dampers. This is the damper pedal. So I'm not going to touch any of these. And then, oh, are you pedals? They're not probably. They're not ready. They're not regulated, but they should all function. Yeah. So, this is the shift. This is the shift. Is the one I'm working on. Uh, you can see the whole action yeah. is, is yeah. sliding from one side yeah. to the other. Yeah. So this will literally hit the hammers on, in a different spot. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll just get a totally different tone. And this one is Sassanudo. And uh, basically this will punch it for you. Okay. Yeah. This will hold those notes. It's kind of like a damper pitch. Selective dampers, uh, so you can choose which which notes ring out and which don't. And uh, we just went to a convention last week, and a concert technician who's really uh, well well seasoned and knows what knows his stuff. He said about two percent of concert pianists use that pedal, <laughs> but they all still need to work. <laughs> so yeah. funny. Oh, was that the piano tech uh, master class? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's good. This corner is by the way. Yes, this one's on its way over to finish your next. So, you know, I just take that on long enough that it'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you for that. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Hi, Tiffany. Hey, Tiffany. Hi. I am currently working on polishing these pedals. Um, they don't look much better, but they were covered in rust, and so you're trying to make them smooth so someone doesn't feel like catching on their sock or something a little funny. And so I just took this apart. It used to look semi like the one sitting over there. Um, and now I'm working on cleaning everything up so everything moves as it's supposed to, because as Lewis just said, everything is supposed to be clean. <laughs> um, so, all these petals were held together with these blocks. And so they pivot in so this is more what it would look like once I had just taken it out um, with these cloth punchings in between each one for as a spacer and as noise abatement because mm. noise Extra noise in your piano is really, really bad. Mm -hmm. well, that, noise, like that noise would be squeaky, right? Between wood and metal? or would, It'd would be, it be squeaky or a click because you're, you don't think about it, but your foot actually doesn't press straight down on the pedal. It kind of goes down into the side. Mm -hmm. So it starts to wear 
and rock. And so you need those spacers so there's something for it to squish into instead of it starting to dig into the block or into the pedal itself. Mm -hmm. um, it's not as much of a problem on these that have the wood next to them, but on the Steinways that have metal, it can create some really bad sounds if you leave your spacers out. Mm -hmm. Oh, I got on the camera. <laughs> I was just like, oh, I can't get close to the pedal. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with me, everybody at home. I'm trying. That's great. And I see another dental tool there. Yes, I was working on getting these out. This is the old cloth that used to be in these um, for noise abatement. The pedal rod would sit right in there and they were glued in and I had to get them out because as you can see, they're a little crusty. Yeah, and, and that's some kind of cloth. Action claw. Huh. Wow. Doesn't look like it now, but it was. <laughs> Is action cloth like felt the way you use felt in other applications? It's it's a, actually a woven material. So felt is felted and cloth is woven. Mm -hmm. And that's a big, uh, they're, they're very similar. Uh, they're both a lot of times made from sheep's wool, but they're so different uh, in, in applications for the piano. Knowing when it should be cloth and when it should be felt is uh, it's pretty important. For, for a lot of the stuff we do, um, even though they're, they're a lot of times used interchangeably, you know, even technicians will say, yeah, we felt the thing and they actually mean use cloth or recloth it and they mean felt. Mm -hmm. um, but there, that's one thing I, you know, that's pretty important is that you get cloth where cloth should be and felt where felt should be. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm seeing a lot of these these same screws. Do you reuse every screw that comes out of these pieces? Uh, if it's damaged, we won't reuse it. Uh, if it's missing, we can't reuse it. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, um, we do. And, you know, pianos uh, of the vintage that we rebuild, they're all, for the most part, going to have slotted screws, which are not as common today as they used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, so we talk about some things like, we got one of the first things that the students did was take these screwdrivers and fit them, uh, hollow grind them to fit the screws that we turn most often. Huh. So wow. just the idea of a screwdriver, buying it off the shelf and using it, uh, it works most of the time for most stuff. You know, my kitchen has a bunch of screwdrivers that I haven't fit to screws maybe, but around here we fit them to this, the screws we're going to use. Mm. That's pretty cool. Um, it's yeah, it's a modification. A, it's a nice detail, and it keeps your work nice and clean. It keeps things fitting nice. Uh, you know, keeps these from getting all torn up and stripped out. Um, and it's you know one of those. I think one of those uh, old world skills that really makes can make your work jump up a little bit. Mm -hmm. I can hear uh, Barb Baker from locksmithing being excited about just hearing the term slotted, uh -huh. slotted screws. Uh -huh. uh, we talked earlier about sort of nomenclature or language around each one of these industries, mm -hmm. and and uh, you know while while out in the in the world with lay people, uh, you would say this is a flathead or something. Uh, you can you can hear here in piano technology and locksmithing, this is absolutely a slotted screw. Well, this is a slotted flathead screw. So the flathead is the. <laughs> This part of it. We're gonna go deeper. Yeah, oh, yeah. oh yeah, we'll go there. <laughs> well, it's also something Jeff said in book pointing yesterday that something that differentiates a, an amateur and a trained professional is how they modify their tools uh -huh. to work for their intended purpose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not not a lot comes off the shelf ready to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's you know, even from our suppliers, most of the time we'll, we'll you'll want to grind something away or tweak something. Um, there's some, you know, legendary folks. I think I have a tour here. I can show you. I'm just loving this thing That's, with your with your clip on. Yeah, those are great that little regulation awesome. rulers. Those rulers are wonderful. This is a little let off tool for adjusting a regulation procedure. And as what as it is, it's a great tool. But you know, there's this uh, legend named Eric Shandall, who has he came by a few years ago, and he modified his tool just. To, to be like this, he cut it shorter and he put that little gooseneck on it. Huh. And I thought, well, I've always liked that tool. I'm a little worried about making it worse, but Eric did it, so I'm gonna try it. And life got better, you know? <laughs> it's just these little things that it just fits in my hand so nicely and it works so much better. Yeah. Um, and just having, you know, having access to those kinds of folks who I can just steal from without any shame and just make my work. Yeah, well, it's, a, it's a true lifelong learning community. Yeah. And I think this is one of these uh, these other themes around sort of the 
the progress and the cycle where when we were in basic piano technology, we were in a conversation where, you know, maybe the piano has not changed very much in 200 years, but the technician's approach, uh, including, you know, this example here um, is always evolving. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, and piano rebuilding is very young, actually. Uh, the, the, going to the, to the lengths that we go to with new soundboards and new pin blocks, um, even you know, replacing key sets is very young, uh, very relatively new. Um, and it's I think we're in maybe the third or fourth generation of people who are doing it. I think David might have been the second generation of people replacing soundboards. And the people who did it first, oh wow, I thank them so much all the time because they had guts, <laughs> you know. They were they were doing things that really no one had done in pianos before. So. Uh, does that mean that there's there's a like a a vat somewhere of pianos that were never rebuilt that you know would have people just dispose of them? No, mostly they just stayed stayed in the living room until now. Stayed, <laughs> or, stayed you know, damaged or totally yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah for the most part. I'm sure you know pianos do go to the dump, and sometimes it's very sad. Sometimes it's not very sad. Is there a piano graveyard somewhere in the world? Uh, I think there's lots of them in city dumps and things like that. Yeah, and this is this is an interesting topic in and of itself, like the history of pianos. And I know that many of the ones that uh, are chosen to be restored here, uh, it, the faculty are very discerning about what is the quality. And there seems to be a period, you know, from say 1800s, early 1900s, and then there's a mass production period that takes place in like the 40s, 50s where you know you are just cranking things out factory made not high quality and just putting you know what label are we going to put on here is it an amf piano or yeah. something else and so i think many of those go to the dump some you know some nice ones may wind up there but but uh when you talked about the age of the piano uh lewis and how how these parts fail and can be replaced i think that that period, 1800s uh, to, uh, you know, up to the 20s and things is uh, those, though the need to repair those inspired that first generation, yeah, exactly. now second, now yeah. third. So it all makes sense, I think, in a chronology mm -hmm. um, yeah. in some way. They started to hit the age where they needed either to go not, not be instruments anymore or get rebuilt, and, you know, and people said, I can do that. And so they did. <laughs> I'll also acknowledge that one of the most common phone calls we get through the front desk are people wanting to donate their pianos. Yes. And we thank everybody for that, but we can't take all of them, obviously, because this building would be chock full of pianos. Yeah, sorry to think as tall as it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's like 20 in the basement that are just lined up oh, yeah. like uh, like an old record collection. Yeah. Oh, that's, the, that's where the piano graveyard is. Well, no, that's the No, that's on deck. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> Are we going to check out the spray booth? Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. Tiffany, thank you very much. Uh, I just, I should have asked Lewis about the technology with the camera over there, but as, as you can see, there's, uh, there's camera setups so that, uh, like other programs, uh, but where you can uh, really the class can be at a safe distance and then and look at very small work uh, that's happening for, for demonstrations for uh, repair here. Oh, there it is. So there's a, yeah, there's a uh, shift lever getting painted. Uh, it's been taped off. The parts that she buffed and polished, she taped off and then pop, pop the tape off and it'll be ready to be uh, rebushed and re-leathered and back into service. So there's no police. So the police system is in there. Yeah, the plate hoist. System? Yeah, yeah. So yeah we, do, we have a plate hoist in here for removing the cast iron plate. And then you wheel that in yeah. on those metal bases. Yeah, there's those those the... parts that are generally they're known as piano tilters, but uh, I use them as plate parts more often, so I call them plate parts. <laughs> These mm -hmm. collection over here, and the ones up here are, tend to be gold because we paint plates on them. Yeah. So they become gold. Oh, and that hammer shaft is gold also. That's there. right. Any of the uh, any of the tools that should live in here oh, have that. gold handles. So that's, <laughs> how we, that's how we try to keep uh, some screwdrivers and mallets and whatnot. Nice. Yeah. Try, <laughs> try to. <laughs> it's working so far. It's good. <laughs> so yeah, this is the booth. We could, you know, we do uh, 
you know, uh, pianos can fit in here. We'll spray the soundboard in the piano. Sometimes we'll do the inner rims. Um, but, you know, we don't do concert grants, so we're limited to in space for, you know, seven feet or less, really. So. Mm -hmm. And then you repaint the letters, and then you order a new label from the manufacturer that will go on yeah. eventually. Yeah, new decals uh, as much as, as we're allowed to. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, most of that stuff is hand lettered on the plate, though. Cool. Wow. Yeah. Um, were we going to look at what Jonathan was doing? Sure. Yeah. This is a trick. If anybody out there wants to see how the column screws. Oh, thank you. This is the secret. <laughs> Pretty awesome. Um, hey, Jonathan. Hello. How's it going, Jonathan? It's going good. Um, so. I have a few screws that came up from the piano. They're really old and dirty looking. Mm -hmm. And what I'm going to do is just sand them. So aesthetically, they look cleaner and um, it helps with accessing them as well. <laughs> And this is that sound that uh, we heard when we first came in here with Jonathan working this press. It's just stable, so it's not doing any damage to the press. Yeah, we don't use, I actually have the chuck key in my pocket, so nobody's tempted to tighten it with the chuck key. Oh, nice. Uh, and so you're uh, you're just doing a little bit of a, a gentle grab on it. Mm -hmm. Most of the time it should grab the body of the screw instead of the threads. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. there's a good inch or so there. Yeah, yeah. so with that, I'm gonna wipe off any excess. Should be a little bit cleaner than before. You can throw the chuck in your pocket so nobody yeah. can. Because you know it's so natural to grab that chuck key right. and click on it. I've, I've done it myself, so I just it's put also, it somewhere you can't reach it. It's <laughs> also one of those things that is the first two are missing. Yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, you have stuff going on. Yeah. So that's the trick. You know, that's a, a nice way to get them really looking looking pretty new. Wow. And acting a lot nicer too. Jonathan, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. You have time to go see what Jensen yeah. Oh yeah. Yep. We have uh, two o'clock. Um, Renee Kelsey is going to be giving her presentation on piano tech tools, and then Eli Cleveland at two thirty for SketchUp. Hey, Jen. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Great to see you. You too. Um, it seems fitting that we're in the North End and I'm making ravioli. <laughs> 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 but um, they ultimately look like this. Oh, they are ravioli. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Nice. Wow. Yeah. What is it? Can I? Yeah. So they're made of Xane, which is a, a wow. synthetic leather with this little piece of felt or a cloth punching. That's what's inside of that? Yeah, yeah. And so the glue is only on the outside. Mm -hmm. um, so that there's sort of what we call it an air pocket inside so that you don't get sound. And they live at the back of um, pedals. Wow, right. yeah. very cool. And I can see that Debbie just chimed in on the chat and said it's called a pedal cushion, but uh, but uh, it's probably fun to call it ravioli. Yeah, on a, on a Stein, this is a Steinway thing. And on a Steinway, it's a, you know, it's a ravioli. On other makes, it'd just be a piece of cloth maybe. And you can't call that a ravioli, so. Mm. You know, <laughs> Yeah, well, we can. <laughs> um, yeah, so. Hi, Debbie. <laughs> so this is how we make them. You uh, put the leather on, on the bottom, which yes. ends up being the top. And then you smush this in. 
And then I'll put some glue around this, smush that on top. And then this is our little call that gets clamped down. So we've got a little assembly line going. Nice. And then they get trimmed up nice and cleanly with a little, a little cutting call that you can cut around. Mm. Wow. It's so specific. Like, I love that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's pretty nice looking too. She's got her trap work all rebuilt, it looks like. Yeah. So we repainted, uh, replaced a bunch of sole leather and other types of um, surfaces that um, help things move quietly and smoothly. Mm -hmm. This is a recurring theme here. Yeah. <laughs> Making everything quiet so that the instrument can, uh, what is can this? do its job. What is this? Um, it's usually some sort of. I don't know, like poplar could be down. It's probably maple. maple. I mean, it looks, yeah. Is it ebonized or what is that? It's just paint. 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 It's black, yeah. It's, it looks, you know, it's mm -hmm. shiny, like it would be ebony or something. Yeah, no, it's, you know, we paint those black on black pianos and brown on brown pianos, and they do a nice job of hiding under there. So, mm -hmm. you know, the little kids don't see them when they're crawling around or something, you know, dogs mm -hmm. don't see them when they're mm -hmm. just on there. <laughs> Yeah. I'm seeing pockets of um, slotted screws everywhere now. Yeah. That's all I'm seeing. It's, all yeah. 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 it's important to know which one goes back where. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, so they're all labeled. Uh, where I was noticing that yeah. uh, the screws that Tiffany's working with are all numbered. Yeah. And, and so this tells us where the keyboard is. Oh, oh really that's cool. great. <laughs> and do you make those also? We made these at the beginning of the year, yeah. Nice. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, so students made uh, Jack in the Boxes, which probably people are aware of. Oh, yeah. Um, and these, we call them, uh, they're screw holders, but we call them coin overs for no good reason. Um, they made tool trays and damper racks for hanging dampers. So there's a lot of stuff that we make just to practice some basic woodworking skills and set you up for work on the backside and be able to do this stuff uh, and offer these service and stay organized and these kind of things. So, mm -hmm. you know, a piece of cardboard works pretty well for that, but around the shop, you use it so much. It's nice to have a dedicated little block of wood for that. So. Yeah. What is your favorite tool to use in this program? Oh, goodness. I might do the hammer. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> just cause that's the ultimate. That's like what you were working well, for. Well, also we, we got to try, you know, saw the I call it the wall of wands oh, yeah. um, um, it, it, yeah. it, and um, we got to just try out all these hammers all fall last year and kind of, kind of find it was very Harry Potter-esque just kind of find the one that we liked best um, and so mine I kind of worked with someone uh, this man named Charles Paul who makes a lot of hammers I think you get your hammer not my okay. wish. Yeah. <laughs> the one that I want is my wish. <laughs> oh, um, and um, he, he, we like picked out wood and a shape and a finish over email mm. and over the phone. Um, so I got this highly customized tool. Wow. Um, last year. Do you have it here, Jen? Uh, I think so. If I don't, I don't. I don't. I don't want to. Tom's put you off off oh, task yeah. from ravioli making but <laughs> and then i i totally when we were in basic uh talking with will and emily uh, the the hogwarts uh reference totally came to me and i i'm glad you said something My <laughs> wow so that was custom made for you to your specifications. Yeah, and many other people here also have hammers for me. Do they make the, the this custom to your to what your grip is? Yeah, so yeah, what? yeah. Wow. Um, and and you pick a length and an angle and mm -hmm. yeah. And right. just over over that time that fall period, you spend so much time with the other hammers. You think this is a, this is a quality that I want in something that's custom to me. Uh, and a lot of it is about sort of the ergonomics of of that for you, right? Yeah, yeah. So, for example, you can have a ball end like this one. You can have a, even a bigger ball end, or it can be just completely straight if you typically hold your hand like this. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you can uh, customize it to you. a little accessory body. Yeah. So that's your favorite tool to yeah. use. Is this is this used frequently in this program? No. What's the most common tool here? Probably screwdrivers or dental picks. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. Dental picks. 
Yeah, we focus on the building here. I mean, the students do go down and tune in the practice rooms. And I should say that on a normal year, uh, student people call the school and uh, we send students out in the field to do tunings, you know, uh, semi-professionally at a student rate. Um, and then also there's opportunities at, at local colleges and local dealerships for students to go to. In uh, Boston Public Schools, I think. In public schools, we have a grant with them so that students can go out and see school, uh, pianos in public schools, which are real examples of pianos that need help. <laughs> so great. Um, so that's you know that's something that most you know most years that's a big part of of uh, not not necessarily of our time here, but of you know something that we cover and something that we continue with the the service minded aspect from from first year. Uh, a lot of it comes down to sort of practice. Piano tuning. All right. Now you have an hour and 20 minutes. What are you going to do? You, know, you got to leave this piano better than you found it. And what do you do? We also have a commissions board on our, the main page of our website. And I think that might funnel some yeah. tuning jobs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we that. get tunings through that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's, and word of mouth, there's a lot of times somebody will come in and say, Hey, I met this person on the train and they, and now I'm going to go tune their piano. You know, <laughs> not just, random stuff, which is how it happens anyway. It's all word of mouth in the long run. Yeah. Nice. I think we've got about five minutes left and then Renee Kelsey is going to give her presentation on tools. So it's so cool that you know, tools are obviously a, a, yeah. a, a huge thing here at North Bennett Street School. Um, I wanted to ask as questions I get a, a lot from uh, people that are thinking of coming to piano technology to either basic or advanced is uh, if you could just uh, share sort of the differences. I get questions about voicing sometimes. Uh, and then I've heard from uh, students in this program sometimes that they feel like being an advanced piano can sometimes feel like uh, you get to put into practice a lot of the things that you pick up in, uh, in basic piano technology. And uh, can I put those questions out to you, uh, Jen and Claire? In first year, we learned a lot about how to put things in the right place and um, to certain specs. And this year, it's um, kind of taking that skill and kind of forming opinions and being able to apply it in a more holistic way um, across the piano and learning different ways of doing things um, and to, to achieve similar or even better results. Um, so there's definitely an, another level of practice um, that we're able to do at a more holistic level. Yeah, what would you say? Yeah, I think that practice is a huge part of it. Like, it's almost like reading music to me. Like, you can read a piece and, you know, you can play it. And, but you really, if you have to really get good at it, you have to practice it and practice it and just put in the time and have a really skilled teacher give you feedback and work with your peers and you know just keep on striving for excellence and that gives me a lot more confidence in my work here um so i feel like i already know a lot more than two months ago yeah, yeah. definitely oh that's great thank you so much uh for sharing your experience here with us um trying to think any uh any other thoughts here not too much. There's a lot of stuff, so it's hard to narrow it down. It is. Uh, it is. We always have trouble cramming it into nine months. Uh, I'm both first year and second year, and you know, once people finish the second year, you go on to third year, which is life. You know, that's sort of how, how you keep going. You keep you keep learning, um, and and that's just sort of part of the whole thing. And for us instructors and master technicians out there in the world, it's true for for everybody. We just keep on finding new things to to look at finding new ways to do it. Sometimes you have a method you really like and you get bored of it. So you try something different, you know, and maybe you like it, maybe you don't, but it's staying in touch and, and keeping, keeping that mindset, you know, that's, that's what it's about, you know. That's you great. I just saw a Debbie again, uh, put in the chat that this is uh, about lifelong learning. The learning never ends. And uh, this is again, this theme, I think that is, all of the full-time programs here at North Bennett Street School, it's lifelong learning. And I think that for when people are thinking about uh, coming here, it, it can be easy to think, okay, I'm gonna go there for nine months, 18 months, and 
leave as sort of a master craft person. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but in truth, we're, it's, it, this is all fundamental. You know, you're coming here to, to learn just enough uh, so that when you leave, you're employable. You have a skill set uh, and you have the confidence. And uh, I just think that that's fantastic. And uh, I, I really appreciate, uh, you know, that everyone has shared what their experience is. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. 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 Uh, Lewis, will you just, uh, for the last couple of minutes, will you just talk to us about the technology uh, here oh, yeah. uh, over where Tiffany was working? Yeah. It, it looks like a huge iPhone. It's a big giant iPhone up yeah. there on the screen. Yeah. So this is basically, uh, we, use, um, we use this for a lot of demonstrations. Uh, and also, again, sort of using the normal year idea. Students go out in the field and they see a weird thing. And, they take a picture of it and they bring it back and we can talk about it uh, or video of how an action is not repeating the way it should or whatever it might be. Uh, and we use, uh, basically it's Apple TV and we just throw things up to, to the TV and you can scroll through your photographs. It's really, really useful. Uh, slideshows and demos, pre we do a lot of pre-recorded demos uh, so that I'm, I'm doing something, I'm focused on it, uh, I'm doing some work and then afterwards, we can talk about it together. So I'm not talking through a demo, I'm, we're watching me do it together, we're watching some other technician do it together. So this is just a big, you know, a big camera boom stand that, uh, that I have. That it's a little little uh, overkill, but it's perfect, you know? No, it looks great. You can uh, really- uh, It's really nice. It allows put you the to camera take, wherever you need yeah, to. The piano is pretty big. Photographs directly, of an, directly on top of an instrument, uh, get it out there. So that's one of the nice things about it. But, um, and you know, uh, just a lot of a lot of uh, just a couple of little iPods that we keep around here, and people's cell phones. And it's really, you know, one of the biggest things that we do is take pictures of just everything, everything, every day. We take pictures. No reason not to take pictures. You don't have to pay to get film developed, but you'll forget everything that you saw unless you have a photograph of it. So. Um, so yeah, we use this uh, really quite a lot. Um, a lot of times we'll pull out a computer or something and do a slideshow that way or a, you know, class that way. Uh, Debbie, uh, who isn't coming in these days, gets to come in via Zoom and give classes to the students. Cool. Uh, which has been pretty awesome. Um, really nice to have her able to, to, we're still able to like learn from her, you know, because yeah. there's so much there. So, um, so. Well, that's that sort of stuff has been really nice and guest instructors uh haven't done any yet this year but last year when we were working from home uh we had guest instructors such good support in the trade of people who are just willing to come and share share what they are doing in their shop um it, it does offer you know a, a, something that we never we've never done before which is seeing other people's spaces and going on little field trips uh, to Florida or to California or to wherever these people might be and they can take us through the, the actual work they're actually doing. So there's a lot uh, a lot to be said for that. I mean it is going working from home you you can't do the, what you can we, we need to do necessarily but you know now that we're back we can still use a lot of that stuff and still you know uh, some of it is a very nice way to do this stuff so yeah that's great. Lewis, thank you so much. Oh, yeah. uh, we're in advanced piano technology uh, with Lewis and uh, and his class. Uh, Debbie, thank you for being on the chat. Uh, I can see that Renee is uh, is ready to uh, share uh, her presentation around piano technician tools. And uh, just going to say um, uh, from everybody in advanced piano, uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is this any better? Hi! Okay, lovely. I'm so sorry about that. Um, 
thank you to everybody who's joining me through this journey through my toolkit today. And um, I would like everyone to direct any questions they may have to the chat and uh, we'll get started. So I wanted to say what works for me may not work for everybody else. Um, so I will showcase some of how I organize my toolkit, um, the modifications I've made to tools, some fabrication and unique places that I've bought some of my tools. Um, everything doesn't have to come from a supply house or from a Home Depot or Lowe's or something. So my toolkit is, oh my goodness, a backpack that seems to grow every time I do something like this. Um, I thought about the work I wanted to do and I knew it needed to be very mobile. So if I can't fix it out of this, then I might be in trouble. Um, I'll just go through some of the pockets and if anybody wants me to go more in depth uh, into anything then I will. So this first pocket here is kind of some of my most important stuff. Um, I'm a firm believer in kits within kits. And so I'll take out um, this and this first. Um, I like to have everything in these clear airplane travel bags, actually, which was an Amazon purchase, but um, it allows me to see everything that's in here and have everything at my fingertips. This is mostly very basic regulation tools. Um, you know, I have my, my capstan turner, I have a ruler, um, an all important flashlight because pianos are dark on the inside. Um, I've also removed some of my favorite things already. So here uh, is, this is a little pill case I bought from CVS and it's probably one of my favorite things because I keep razors inside of it. And this way I don't have to fumble around for a razor. You only have to get cut once. Um, one of my other favorite things, I have a, a screwdriver here. I use this to um, regulate drop in the piano, but I loved the handle and hated the tip. So I modified it. It was the same width from here all the way up and I took it to the grinder and made sure that it fit what I wanted to use it for, um, which was just kind of a simple, I don't like it, but I can like it <laughs> idea. Um, I keep a single needle voicing tool and I love this tool a lot. It fits in the strings, in between the strings, and it's perfect for last minute adjustments before a concert or something where I don't wanna remove the action. But um, the needle's here, and this always fell down or off or something, so I modified it just with a little piece of tape so that now when I'm rummaging around and looking for it, I don't, I don't poke myself. <laughs> that used to happen more than I would like to admit. Um, another really important thing I keep with me are earplugs. Um, I tune by ear as everybody who leaves North Bennett, um, you know, knows how to do. And these are my preferred brand, but I need to protect my hearing from decibels that are too high, uh, mainly for test blows. And so without these, I'm almost useless. Um, so another kit within a kit that I like to keep are um, uh, my liquids kit. Oh, I see a question. Um, so someone had asked if you have time, could you please speak to what work you do in your daily life? Um, I'm a university technician and I also over summers work for the Tanglewood Music Festival. And so everything needed to be a little bit portable. I go from practice rooms to concert halls and um, I have to make on the spot repairs in between rehearsals or or after a concert before the next rehearsal the next day or something. And so I just wanted to make sure that I could carry everything with me uh, that might be necessary. You never know what you'll run into. <laughs> um, so my liquids kit, um, I like to keep a lot of things in here, but I like to keep them kind of small. You don't need a lot of everything. And so I have like a little bit of metal polish and a little bit of glue. I keep two kinds of glue just because I feel like it, um, but I keep them in these little bottles. I like them because it's enough glue to get a lot of a big job or a small job done. 
and it's not the whole container. And so I'm not weighing down my tool bag. Um, the last time I weighed it, just with what's in it, it was almost 40 pounds. So I'm looking to get things out, not put things in. Um, I also keep some McLube 440. I love this stuff. Um, and I also love the applicator. It's like a little cotton ball on the end and it kind of gets exactly where I need it to and nowhere else. I also keep a little bit of Protec powder. This is just like um, one of those little paint, um, paint cases, I guess, that would come with like a paint by numbers thing. I kind of took it off and repurposed it. Okay, so, Oh my goodness. So as for the rest of this kit, this backpack was, um, I guess it was marketed as an electrician's toolkit, but I've definitely repurposed it for piano technician's toolkit. One of the things I like about it is that it kind of lays flat on the inside. It has a lot of pockets. And so there are some things that I can reach in here for with my eyes closed and know exactly what I need uh, and where it is. Um, the most important thing that I keep um, with me at all times is my tuning hammer, of course. Uh, I loved that in the previous section, it was called the wall of wands at North Bennett. But <laughs> as soon as I saw this, I, um, I, I kind of knew this was for me. Um, it's ergonomic, it's a Rayburn weaver, and I, I love it. I loved it so much that this is for grands, but I ordered another Rayburn for uprights. Um, this is an impact hammer. And instead of hold, having to hold it here and doing a very awkward um, thing with your body to tune uprights, there's a weight on this hammer and the tip rotates. And so instead of me having to you know, do everything to turn the tuning pin, um, this hammer does it for me by quick motions and the weight moves everything. It's lovely. It, take, it took the strain off of my shoulders and back and I couldn't do without this for an upright. Um, the other thing I really enjoy um, about the, the velvet <laughs> bags that they came with is that I keep all of my mutes in there too. So if I have my hammer, I know that I have my mutes. Um, without one, I couldn't do the other. So. I don't tune a lot of uprights, and so it's kind of, um, a, you know, a catch-all of mutes, but I, I use them all, so they can stay. Um, one of the next most important tools, just a regular old flathead screwdriver. Um, this gets used for action parts and for taking the action out um, for some case parts. Uh, it's um, a Swiss it's a Swiss screwdriver. And so it's, you know, it's my preferred one because the tip fits a lot of different things. And, you know, you can't, you can't get into a, most pianos without a screwdriver. Um, that's also an example of something that comes from a hardware store. Um, a few examples of things that come from supply houses. Um, sometimes when you need a tool, you just have to have it. These are damper wire bending pliers. And there's a little, there's a smile or a frown depending on which way that the damper wire has to go. And this is something that, you know, you when you need it, you need it. Um, this pocket is kind of uh, <laughs> things I don't use super often, but still like to carry. Um, another example of a kit within the kit is my stringing, my stringing tools. So I keep um, this tool roll for all of my stringing needs. And I like it because I don't have to pull a tool from a bag um, and collect them to fix a string. I just pull this out and I know I have everything I need. So I'll kind of hold this up. Um, some, some of these are specialty tools and some of them aren't, um, like a regular pair of pliers. 
I have another way to cut music wire, but I always like to have a backup for some of my tools that, uh, that I really need. And so if I didn't have my wire cutters in here, at least I had my pliers. Um, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite stringing tools are these pliers because they don't, um, they're parallel pliers, they don't close all the way. And so when I have to squeeze the string on a tuning pin, it fits absolutely perfectly. And it always lets me have access to what I need access to. And um, one of my really good friends turned me on to very tiny vice grips. Um, it's, I don't need vice grips bigger than this. And so this is, this is what I keep and I love them. It was one of the better $6 I've ever spent. Um, another reason I like keeping all of my, um, all of my tools in this tool row is that if I am in a client's home, then this is, this is cloth. It's already protected. And so if I put it on the bench, then I know that my tools aren't scratching anything. And I know that, um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna leave any dents or damage or anything. And it's also a place for my tools to go back to, um, my stringing roll was another wonderful Amazon purchase. It is called Dickies. Um, and I, you know, I've had this thing for years and it is holding up. What more can you ask for? <laughs> okay. So a third pocket in here. So I had to think about what kind of work I was going to be doing most frequently. And that's kind of my, my thought process for these kits. And so at the bottom of this backpack um, is my center pinning kit. Um, I keep uh, almost everything I need except my micrometer in there, um, some flush cutting uh, pin nippers, what North Bennett affectionately calls a phaser, but I guess it's um, a center pin pusher, but it kind of you know, does this. Um, I also love the case in which my center pins are kept. I, I used to keep them in, in stackable pill cases, but eventually I just said, you know what, for the size, this is worth it. There are numbers on each of these and on the bottom we have little holes and I love it because again, it's clear. I can see what I have, what I'm missing and um, what I need to order more. So my center pinning kit. I was on HSN one time and I found a um, travel jewelry kit, I suppose. And I was like, this is perfect for my toolkit. So um, it was four of these and they kind of came on a roll. I've since discarded the, the roll, but they're soft on the bottom. I know if I put these on the piano somewhere, I won't be scratching it or messing up the, the finish or a tuning pin or the plate. Um, and so I, I love, I love these. This one is kind of a catch all of like felt for, for bushing, um, key bushing, and also for upright hammer repair. Um, I keep pieces of veneer because you never know. Um, as, <laughs> as Lewis was mentioning in the previous section, I also keep dental picks. Um, these are probably not exactly dental picks. They're from Ace Hardware, but they're really great for scraping out glue in very tiny places. Um, I keep a variety of, of other things. I don't know, toothpicks um, for glue application and rubber bands. I keep um, really small screwdrivers. You just don't know what exactly you're going to need. And so I found a variety of things will be useful in the end. Um, this specifically is my voicing kit. I have a lot of things in here that I love. I'll just pick out a couple of my favorites. Um, this was a gift, uh, <laughs> a little piano themed um, file. It's very soft grit. And so this is kind of a final filing for, for hammers or if I want to, you know, fit something to the strings. Um, this is a travel Q-tip case. I love this for chalk. 
um, I have very soft chalk to be able to mark the keys and have it not be permanent. And I obviously dropped it on the floor once and it broke. So we got a case, problem solved. Um, one of the other things that I keep in here um, is, you know, my all important voicing tool. This is a very basic voicing tool. It has, um, it has three needles. And I will say that I don't use it um, very often. A lot of voicing, in my opinion, is in regulation. Um, so the needles come out at the end for a small amount of time. Let's see. Um, so someone said it appears um, that I do pretty extensive repairs. Um, what does a what does a toolkit for tuners look like? Okay, so I'll say that I tune uh, primarily. I do a lot of repairs, but most of my day is spent tuning. And for me, that means that I take my kit apart a little bit. I these are um, temperament strips, and I I always keep them nice so I can kind of just um, keep them compact and just roll them out when I need them. So I'll take my two temperament strips. I will take my light repair kit and throw these in. I will take my earplugs and I tune primarily grands. And so between these three items and a screwdriver, that's all that I keep for basic tuning. Um, that allows me to tune the piano, save my hearing, and uh, if there are one or two things that are wrong that I notice while tuning, then you know I can fix them pretty quickly and that's it. Uh, and all of these things usually live in my purse, actually. So in my mind, my purses have never been more useful. Um, there was one other, let's see. Oh, someone had asked what I like best about my work. Um, I, I really love being able to go to a piano and make it better. I, I like facilitating the creativity of music and, and helping to put on concerts or even just um, a degree recital. Those are, we have a lot of them at Peabody. And I just like making it so that the people who play the piano can just focus on the piano. They don't have to worry about what might be clicking or squeaking or the tuning or anything they can just do what they do because I've done what I do best. Um, let's see. <laughs> let's see. Ah, you went from 40 pounds to a medium sized purse. <laughs> yes, uh, that is a nice savior on my back. I, I will be forthcoming. I do not carry this um, eight hours a day, six to seven days a week. Um, I carry my purse. <laughs> for that amount of time. This toolkit is kind of when I know that there's an issue or when I'm at Tanglewood. So uh, I went through my stringing kit, but do I carry strings? Yes, I do. I carry two sizes of strings and they're all kind of wrapped up in this manila envelope. Um, sorry, I carry two sizes of each size of string from 13 to 16 and a half. Um, I used to only carry until 15 and a half. And then I had somebody who had a string that was 16 and 16 and a half and, and thought perhaps I should just add those sizes and save myself in the future. Um, I also carry, um, you know, carbon paper. This is actually um, this is actually one of my most overlooked tools, I suppose. Um, but it's really useful. It goes in between the hammers and the strings, and then it allows me to do some of my work more efficiently. And it's not permanent. There are a lot of things in the piano that eventually you'd like to undo, and black marks on white hammers are one of them. Um, another one of my Manila envelopes is just. Uh, sandpaper. <laughs> um, I carried this because I had to um, uh, fix a key once and 
and file some hammers and I realized that my sandpaper had lost all of its grit over the four years I had put it through intensive work and perhaps I should have a way to fix that on the spot. Um, I have another question. How did you how did you know you wanted to study and do this work? Have you always been an organized problem solver? Um, <laughs> uh, yes and no. I knew I wanted to do this work the moment that I toured North Bennett in the old building. Um, gosh, that must have been 11 years ago now. And I saw the inside of a piano and I saw all the mechanisms. I saw um, how me playing the key produced a sound and I was hooked. I knew I had to learn more. And so, mm, I don't know, eight years later, I enrolled in the school and, you know, the rest was history. Um, as far as being an organized problem solver, I'll say that I've always been pretty organized. And so I really enjoyed and took pride in putting my toolkit together in figuring out how it might work and what I might need and, you know, getting rid of stuff also. Um, so let's see here. This is, <laughs> this is kind of my last catch-all bag. Well, it's my only catch-all bag. It's my last clear kit. Um, in here are just tools that either I don't use very often or they were too big to really go anywhere else. So I'll pull out a few of my favorites. Um, these are called key easing pliers. Um, this is another tool where when you need it, you need it. So if the key is, um, you know, getting stuck when depressed or something. Uh, occasionally, the bushings have become too tight around the pin. This this kind of solves it very quickly, too. Um, one of my favorites, gifted to me by a friend, um, is this is actually hammer felt uh, on a little wood block. And it erases the chalk after you put it onto wood. And I love that, because if I touch chalk, then it usually gets everywhere else, too. And when I'm in a client's home or I'm doing concert work in a hall, I like to be very neat and very tidy. And so having a little chalk eraser really kind of made my day. <laughs> um, ooh, an unusual find. So you can find these anywhere that uh, they sell sewing, sewing needles, essentially. These are all my voicing needles um, that are backups, but it's on a little magnetic plate and I really enjoy this because it's flat, it fits anywhere. My needles are not just all over my bag and it, uh, it closes, it shuts very tightly. And at least if I break a needle, which I've done, um, then I'll have a backup too. Uh, one of my more important tools actually is this combo handle here. Um, this combo handle fits a lot of tools. And so instead of having separate handles for everything, I can just put a screwdriver into my combo handle or, you know, so I have, I always have this backup flathead screwdriver. So, you know, it fits into my combo handle or I have an upright damper spoon bender into the combo handle. Um, I <laughs> don't know what I would do if every single one of my combo handle tools had its own handle. I mean, it just, my tool bag would be 50 pounds. Um, another question, how do you picture your future short term as long, oh, as well as long term? Uh, let's see. I would say short term, I just, I like to learn something every day that I work. And so even if it's, um, you know, trying a new idea and knowing that it failed or trying something new and learning you know, something completely different. It doesn't matter um, if it's about a piece I've been struggling with and I figured out this new technique to tune it. I just, I just want to learn anything that I can. Um, now, long term, I, I would love to, you know, run my own program at a university or something and really manage an inventory and make sure that we're giving students and faculty and guest artists the, the best pianos that they could play on um, in, in, in our care. So, you know, North Bennett was absolutely instrumental in giving me this education to facilitate 
um, you know, those long-term goals. Now, um, I would like to ask, are there any questions? Is there anything else anyone would like to know? Um, otherwise, I have a couple other tools that I can showcase. Um, one, one that I made that was uh, shown before actually was the screw holder. This is my version of it. <laughs> I use it all the time still. So uh, anything that North Bennett has you build in this program, then um, you'll use it. <laughs> the, um, the name of my upright hammer is a Rayburn and you can go online. Um, you can Google Nate Rayburn, um, you know, hammer maker and you'll, you'll find it. Um, I, I love it. Couldn't tune with tune it upright without it. Wouldn't want to. Um, yes, I did both programs at North Bennett and the description of both programs was very, very good. Uh, the fact that in first year you're learning specs and just kind of how things move and how things are coming together and how to tune. But in second year, you're really learning, um, you know, kind of you're getting the behind the scenes look at everything. And so I think for me, both years were really important. And second year also made me really comfortable in, um, if I break it, I can fix it. <laughs> Not that I'm trying to break things, but it happens, you know? Um, the last tool that I'll feature here is um, I, I made a key pin cleaner. And so essentially without having to take off the, the keys of the action or take everything out, if a key is sticking on a pin, uh, if this was the pin, then I can kind of lift up the keys and fit this in here. And there's buckskin on the inside. And so it kind of like gets rid of some grime and it does the charm every single time. Uh, the duckbill shape was also intentional <laughs> to make sure that I had enough, um, you know, enough pressure on each side. Um, so let's see. Yes. Oh, thank you, Debbie, <laughs> the Rayburn Impact Tuning Weaver. Um, so with this last minute, I'd like to thank all of you for joining me through my toolkit tour. And I would also like to introduce Eli Cleveland. He will be teaching right after me. Um, and he will be going over introduction to SketchUp. So again, thank you so much for joining me. And I, I really enjoyed showing everybody what my toolkit is like. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Eli Cleveland, and I am a graduate from the cabinet and furniture making program at North Bennett Street. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, SketchUp, which is a 3D drawing program that I've been using for 10 or 11 years now. Um, I first used it kind of during my time as a student at North Bennett, and I've used it a lot in my work as a furniture maker, and now I use it as an instructor at North Bennett. Um, I teach SketchUp to the full-time students and uh, in continuing ed. Um, I do wanna thank you all for coming to this weird, bizarre year and this open house and everything. This is my first webinar, so I'm probably in the same boat as a lot of you. Um, for those who have not heard of SketchUp, kind of a very brief history here. Uh, SketchUp was developed in the early 2000s when 3D drawing software was at the time really meant for engineers and architects and people who had some background in engineering of some kind. Um, more and more people wanted to use it for the trades, for design, for kind of hobby work or work around the house. And so uh, this company developed SketchUp as a way to be a really accessible 3D drawing software. It was soon bought by Google. It got really popular when Google had it. Now they've offloaded it to a company called Trimble, which is who owns it now. Um, the concept being that you can get into SketchUp and you can use it like you would Microsoft Paint. There are a handful of tools that you're gonna use to get 99% of your work done. Um, and then it can be used to uh, kind of interface with those more advanced design programs if you need that. It can be exported as blueprints. Um, it's a really, really versatile tool. So I'll talk a little about some of that. Um, my original motivation for using SketchUp was to talk with other woodworkers. 
since then I did it a few years with that. It was just easier than trying to draw something and scan it and email it. Uh, as I got into working for myself, I realized that it was also a fantastic tool for communicating with clients. Uh, SketchUp allows me to have my construction drawing and kind of a client's sort of aesthetic drawing in the same place. So while I can have behind the scenes what dovetails I'm doing and how the joinery is going to work and things like that, I can quickly hide that because it can be confusing for someone who doesn't understand it. And I can present to a client, this is what we're looking at. It has four drawers. It'll sit next to your fireplace like this. It's about this high compared to your other furniture and things like that. So um, during this time, I will be trying to monitor our chat window. Uh, so if you have any questions, please pop them in there. Um, I will mostly be trying to work through uh, some examples here. And so I will also reserve some time at the end to answer questions. Uh, if you want to save them for the end or just put them in the window, I'll look back. Um, I know some of you are going to be trying to follow along here, so I'll try to keep the pace manageable. So let me just switch over to my SketchUp window. And here we go. So I have here the desktop version of SketchUp. Uh, mine's the pro version. For this, it doesn't really matter. And honestly, for most of SketchUp, the version doesn't matter. They all do pretty much the same thing. The web version looks a tiny bit different, but it's really just a different layout. It's all the same tools. Uh, I have the simple template here. So we have our friend Laura, which they put in there just to give you a sense of scale. Sadly, we're going to say goodbye to Laura. So I'll just click once there and hit delete to erase that icon. Um, SketchUp always works by drawing in two dimensions and then pushing or pulling into three dimensions. So the first tool I'm going to use is called the rectangle tool, and it's right up here in my toolbar. The rectangle tool wants me to click twice, so I'll click once to start my rectangle. And then you can see as I drag, it starts to build this box for me, and I'm dragging the opposite corner. So if I click there, we've developed a rectangle. It fills it in for me. It knows that I, I wanted the four sides and I wanted that flat sheet of paper as well. The tool right next to it is push-pull, and this is really the, the workhorse of SketchUp. As I drag over my rectangle, it highlights. I'm going to click once, and as I move it up, you can see it pulls into three dimensions. You know, I can then move around any surface in SketchUp. You can push-pull and make an adjustment to. I can also come back with my rectangle tool and I can add more rectangles and then back to push pull and I can change these around and make different adjustments. So it's really always drawing on some flat surface and then going into three dimensions with that, that uh, pattern that we've drawn. Now, the most important tool in SketchUp that I use all the time, I usually keep my hand on the keyboard on the fingers, is undo. Uh, it's the regular undo from Microsoft Word or from the web browser. It's either Command-Z or Control-Z if you're on uh, Mac or PC. Uh, it's also up in your edit menu. There's an undo. Um, and then if you're on the web version down in the bottom corner of your screen, or they might have switched it to the top corner of your screen, there's a little swirly arrow. So if I hit undo here, you can see it just steps back and back and back. You can undo all the way back to, to yesterday if you need to. I'm going to back up to my box. So if I want to turn this box into, anyone who's taking my SketchUp class knows that I, uh, I generally start with doing a die, a, die, a six-sided die. Under my rectangle tool, there are other shapes here. So I'm going to go with the circle tool. The circle tool works similarly to the rectangle. I'm going to click once, and that's the center of my circle. And then as I pull the circle out, it, does the, it increases the radius. And you can see as I go here, SketchUp's full of little shortcuts to help us. What it's doing now, it has this little dotted line to the center of my original circle, because it's kind of making a suggestion that, hey, you drew one circle, you probably want the second one to line up with it somehow. So I'm going to let it do that. I'll draw my second circle here. It'll do the same thing for me again for a third. And as I come around here, it actually locks onto both of these previous circles. I can draw my four circles. Back to the push-pull tool. And I can give them a little bit of depth. 
you probably get the idea now. SketchUp again is going to help me if I want to draw on this right side. Then it's going to automatically switch the circle around so it lays flat on that side. Let's say on this side I do two. And then back to push pull. As I try to do other sides, it starts to get a little bit tight. I can get a circle up there, but I can't see what's going on. So here's where we entered what to me is probably the hardest part of SketchUp, if you will. Um, the biggest difference watching someone who has used it for years versus when you're first learning is learning to navigate in SketchUp. Um, so as I try to draw a circle up here, I'm going to hit escape to stop it. I need to turn the camera so I can see above better. There's a little group of tools here in the middle of my toolbar at the top. The first is orbit. Orbit, you just click and drag and we can swing up above. And you can see I'm just orbiting around this object and moving the camera. I can see the backside, I can see the top. The second tool here is the hand, it's the pan tool. Now, if you're on the web version, these are all gonna be on the left side of your screen um, under the same menu. The hand is gonna kind of keep the camera at the same angle and just slide left, right, or up, down. Again, I'm clicking and dragging. And then the final important navigation tool is zoom. And that's you click and either drag up to zoom in or drag down to zoom out. So getting comfortable with these is a huge learning curve in SketchUp, but it's really the biggest one. Once you can kind of move around um, like it's second hand, then you're gonna really be able to move quickly. The nice thing about all of these tools is if you have kind of a standard scroll wheel mouse, I just waved it in front of the screen, but you can't see me. Um, <laughs> if you have a scroll wheel mouse, um, then all of these tools are actually already on your mouse. If you scroll, roll the scroll wheel up, it zooms in, down zooms out. If you click your scroll wheel in, then that automatically lets you orbit. So you don't even have to go up to your toolbar to do these things. So as I come around, and as we come around, if you're following along, we can now come up here and do our dot on top with the circle tool again. Again, we push pull. Come around the back. See if we can do this right. Four there, and that means, well, I've already messed this up. Well, it's not gonna be a Vegas regulation die. That's okay. <laughs> It'll get the job done. Move these in and so on and so forth. So I always use this. It's a good way to practice orbiting around and navigating our space. Um, and also of course, to, to practice with these basic tools. I'm not gonna make you suffer through all of this with me though. Um, this is fun and it's a lot of fun to be able to just play with SketchUp like that, no pressure. Um, if we wanted to do something else, Let's say I want to do a house. I'm going to go to my select tool and just drag a big box over that and hit delete. So we can keep playing with that if you want to. If we want to do uh, something with more precision though, that's where SketchUp really shines. So I'm going to go back under my circle, my shapes tool to rectangle. When I drew this rectangle before, I just kind of clicked arbitrarily. We didn't really know how big it was. Um, as we saw, it wasn't a cube at all. When we're actually going to do a project, whether it's around the house or for a client, we need to know those dimensions. We need our proportions to be right on. So if we look, when I'm dragging this box, if you look in the bottom right corner of the screen here, it tells the dimensions of that box. Uh, my dimensions in the simple template are in feet and inches. They have different templates that can be inches only, it can be in meters or millimeters, whatever you work in or whatever you're used to. So as I draw this, one way to be more precise is I can just keep an eye on that box. Um, that's kind of a painful way to do it. The other thing I can do is actually just type a number. The odd thing to get used to here is that when I click once and start dragging, I don't have to go click in that text box. I just start typing. So if I want to type, let's say 10 feet comma 12 feet and hit enter, it'll automatically snap to 10 feet by 12 feet. Um, 
Um, how you can prove? Uh, sorry, I'm just reading in the chat. I will talk about making uniform dimensions <laughs> in just a minute. <laughs> um, so, as so, I have my 10 foot by 12 foot rectangle there. Depending on the template you use, if you type 10 comma 12, it might be feet, it might be inches, it might be millimeters. For our purposes today, that's that's not going to matter. The push pull tool has the same. Um, kind of feature. So if I go to push pull and I click once to start moving this, you can see I'm in the midst of moving it. Again, down in the bottom right corner of my screen, it's telling me dimensions and I can just type in the dimension I want. So I don't have to click down there. I just start typing a number. So let's say I do 10 feet again. So I'm doing 10 apostrophe to make sure it knows I want feet. Um, so now we have a little box where we know exactly what these dimensions are. Uh, if we want to turn this into a little bit of a house, then I'm going to switch to doing a little bit of detail with our line tool. The line tool is the one that looks like a little pencil. Um, this is uh, where SketchUp really starts to differentiate itself from some of the other programs out there. SketchUp makes these suggestions about where to start and in my line to help me line things up. Um, and it kind of erases the ones I don't need and just gives me the important ones. So you can see it highlights a midpoint. Over here, it highlights an endpoint. If I'm just along this line, I'm on the edge. It'll tell me if I'm on the face somewhere. So it helps me really make sure my cursor is where I want it to be. If I want to draw the roof here, I can click on my midpoint to start my line. And then I can come over to the side and I can just come anywhere over here on the edge and click again. And it marks my line on there. If I come back to the same starting point at the top, start a new line and come down to the other edge. As I move up and down that edge, you can see it hesitate and it'll help me line up with where my first point was drawn. So I know these two lines are ending in the same spot. As we've been doing the whole time, We've drawn in two dimensions the shape we want. So we switch to push pull, click on the surface that I want to move. And this time we're going to push it down to zero and it'll stop us at the back of the box. When you push something down to zero and click, it erases it. So we can click and push it down to zero. So two ways to use the push pull. If you have something flat, it draws it into three dimensions. If you have something 3D and you push it to flat, it gets rid of it. So now we're cooking. How cozy. That roof's gonna hold a lot of snow, especially on Wednesday if you're in the Northeast. Uh, now we can go in kind of the same process over and over as add detail in two dimension, move it to three dimension, two, three, two, three. So I'm gonna add some windows and a door. To do layout in SketchUp, they have a tape measure tool. It's well-named. Uh, it works as a tape measure in pencil. It'll do two things for us. One is if we measure from an end point. Let's say I just measure up here. Can we see it gives me this little kind of hash mark there, calls it a guide point. What that does is it gives me a point to lock onto with my cursor. You can see that SketchUp jumps to it every time. Um, so I can use that to then measure off other points. I could use that to start a line or start a rectangle from. I'm gonna undo though. The other way to use the tape measure is if I measure off of an edge, it gives me a parallel edge. So in this case, if I want a row of windows, let's say, I can measure off my bottom edge and I can come up, let's say 30 inches. And that can be the bottom of my windows. I'll come up from that line, another, like 48, oh, those are big windows. Let's come up 36. So again, I clicked once to start, started to drag my line and then just started typing 36 and hit enter. And then I can come off my walls. Let's come over, well, let's try 20 inches. And I'm saying 20 inches in SketchUp, I'm just typing 20 and it's assuming inches for me. If I, want to, um, if I want it to be feet, I could use the apostrophe. 
I'm going to come 20 inches off of this wall and hit enter. And then we can do the width of our windows. I would recommend when you're learning SketchUp, absolutely abuse these, this uh, tape measure tool. Um, the, all of these lines don't mess up your drawing in any way. They're really just kind of pencil marks on a board or they're kind of chalk lines, things that can be erased later. So I'll lay out a window. I'll do a 30 inch window there and 30 inches there. As I'm moving around here, you're gonna notice a couple of things and please let me know if, uh, if you're getting lost. One is that I am using the mouse to switch. You know, right now I have my tape measure. I'm pressing down my scroll wheel to switch in orbit and I'm rolling my scroll wheel to zoom. So you might not see me go up and switch tools there. The other thing I'm in the habit of is almost all of these tools have a keyboard shortcut. So instead of going up to my rectangle tool, I can just hit the R key and it switches to my rectangle tool. Or instead of going to my toolbar and choosing the tape measure, I can just hit T for tape measure. Those are shortcuts you'll learn as you use SketchUp. Uh, if you want to uh, learn a few of them quickly, they're listed in the menus. Also, if you search online for the SketchUp quick reference card, um, that will give you a rundown of all the standard shortcuts in SketchUp. They are loaded by default in every version. So whether you're on the web version or the desktop, all your shortcuts are going to be there. Um, so I will sometimes jump tools. I'll try to make sure I always tell you where the tool is before I use the shortcut though. So, so now that I have my layout, the rectangle tool is going to help me here. And it's really simple. All my points are already there. You can see SketchUp snaps right to them. And I can just snap those windows on there like that. If I want to add um, a frame around those windows, we have a very handy tool here. We have our offset tool. Uh, it's right next to my push pull. The offset, to, so one way, just to remind you, we don't need really much more than the tape measure, the rectangle and the line. We could always, Use a tape measure to come off of every side of our window the same amount. It's going to get messy and it's going to be time consuming. So SketchUp has you know, a handy tool to help us with that. It's the offset. For the offset, I'm going to highlight the area that I want to draw a border around. Click once to select it. And you can see as I drag my mouse, it can offset to the inside or the outside. And just as with everything else, I'm going to start to move it to the outside. And I'm just going to type in six and hit enter. And it gives me a six inch border around my window. Same thing over here, six inches and hit enter. And now I can switch back to push pull again in two dimensions. I have my windows now. I can pull my trim out an inch, let's say. I can push my windows in an inch, give them a little depth. And those are some very impressive windows on our very tiny house. Uh, as this starts to get cluttered, the reason I love the tape measure tool is because if you go up to your, you can always just highlight with your regular cursor, just click on one of these tape measure marks and hit delete. Click and hit delete. The other thing you can do is go up to your edit menu. And under your edit menu, you know, you'll have the standard stuff, copy, paste, cut, all that. There's one called delete guides. And delete guides is going to instantly delete all of your tape measure marks, whether they're the little dots or whether they're the lines. I'm sorry, I know my edit menu doesn't show up on the, the screen share. Um, but it's right there in your edit menu. It's about the sixth item down, delete guides. So that tidies us right up. Um, as we work around, we can do the same thing for doors. We can do as much layout as we want. And so I'm going to, in this case, lay out a center line. So I just measured from my wall over to the center point. And then I can come back and make my door however big I want. Boom, 36. And what? 
Cool. And again, push pull there, give us some depth. We could use the offset. So you can start to see how just these, I'm going to delete my guides again. We've only learned maybe four tools. We've already used rectangle, circle, push pull, offset, and line, five tools. Um, and already you can start to see how we could go in here if we wanted to add some mullions to the window. We could just add rectangles in there, offset to give them dimension and push pull. And it's really just about doing that, getting the, the structure in place, laying out your details, drawing them, making them 3D. Lay out, draw 3D and keep getting smaller and smaller. Um, I, I'll see a couple of questions here. If I have an existing 3D object that can be captured on photo video, where of a way to interact it with SketchUp? Um, there are a couple of things to look into for that. Um, you can import 3D models from other sources into SketchUp. Um, and SketchUp does a pretty good job. You're going to need the pro version of SketchUp to do it well. The actual software for getting that 3D model of a real life object, I don't remember. I know I've seen apps that can do it on your phone from a series of photos. Um, you can use kind of 3D scanners. But the SketchUp can import a variety of 3D models. Um, someone also asked about replicating uh, shapes in here. So let's say I have laid out my first window here. You can. Uh, just like in any program, there's edit, copy, and edit, paste. Or you can use your keyboard shortcuts, copy and paste, to lay these out. Um, there is also, this is going to be a little fancy, um, but there is also a way, there's a move tool. So if you are moving something around, I can turn on a feature that lets me move a copy of it. And then you can actually even multiply your copy of it. I know that's a little advanced. There's a lot to process there. But if you've used editing software in the past, you can do arrays, or you do a series of objects, or you divide things evenly and things like that. Um, please do keep coming with questions if you have the questions. Is there a way to change the scale? Uh, there are a couple of ways to do that, depending on exactly what, uh, what you're looking for. Zooming in is in and out is just like if I'm standing here looking across the street and I zoom in with uh, my iPhone or zoom in with my camera. The thing I'm looking at doesn't change. It's just the size in my viewfinder. There is a scaling tool. If you want to scale everything evenly, then SketchUp does have a scaling tool. Oops. And so I am able to select and scale. And that will actually change the dimensions of my object. Um, that's probably going to be what you're trying to do there. Uh, please keep the questions coming if you have them. I do also want to oops, um, share a few things here, a few other stop, SketchUp uh, related things that I've done recently to show you some of the other things SketchUp can do. This is a SketchUp model I did recently um, for a class actually that we do in continuing ed. One of the things that's great about SketchUp is versatility. I use it for furniture work. You know, it's a certain scale. It's you know usually within six feet by six feet. You know, a table, a desk, something like that. Uh, I've taught it to interior designers, and so you can do these things with textures and with detailing um, that get you a little bit more of the broad scope of the space you're using. Within that, SketchUp has a lot of great presentation options. So here I can add dimensions to my model and I can get rid of the perspective so I have a nice true camera angle. Um, and I also, if I swing around here, you can see I've actually sliced the room. So it'll show where all the windows are and show where the doors are. Same thing, I can have different slices. All these are preset. So if I'm presenting to someone, I can have this all set up. There's no kind of flying around my space. Everything's preset, the size of the windows, the height, show the layout of my window seat and things like that. Um, you can also, I use it for 
my furniture work. And so it's a lot of stuff like this. There's how I would present to a client. I have all the wood grain on there. It shows all the detailing, the brass feet. This is more what I would work from, very simple. Hidden in that, again, I have these presets are all my construction details, how it's built. I can even break it apart if I'm trying to explain it to someone else. I have all the details about the joinery and things like that. Finally, if you really want to just, this is something I did recently, just, I had a minute. I've had a lot of free time this year. Um, SketchUp actually does some really great stuff as far as rendering. Um, not only can you do the sun and the shadows, you can tell SketchUp where in the world this room is, and you can adjust the sun to, in case, you know, for some people in a house say, you wanna know when the, the sun's coming in that window. Is it gonna be in your eyes in December? Is it gonna be bearing down on your, your couch in the summer? And so you can actually tell SketchUp where in the world you are and adjust the lighting for that. Um, if we don't have any other questions, let me come back and say hello to you. Um, oh, here we go. I was in this. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, it was a lot. I wanted to, to give you an idea of what SketchUp can do. Um, so uh, one question I always get is for tutorials for SketchUp. It's a lot to do in, a, in 30 minutes or even in a class. SketchUp uh, has actually a pretty good thing on their own website called SketchUp Campus. Um, they have really good tutorials. Even after I've been doing it for years, I went through those and you still learn some tricks. And they kind of work you through from simpler to more complicated things. Um, there are also a lot of great videos out there for SketchUp. I find they're really good for certain problems. Like I can't remember how to, how to do that row of windows. And you can find a short video for that. It's hard to find a video for SketchUp basics. Oh, well, there, it's easy to find one. It's hard to find one that works perfectly for you. But, uh, but SketchUp Campus, uh, it's on SketchUp's website. That's a great place to start for tutorials. Um, do we have any other questions? Can you do me using the follow along tool? The, so someone asked about the follow along tool, the follow me tool. Um, I, I don't have time to get into it right now. It's SketchUp's coolest but weirdest tool. It's essentially gonna work like our push pull did, but instead of push pulling in one direction, you can follow a curvy line. And so you're still gonna need, you're gonna need your pattern laid out flat and you're gonna need a path that you're pushing along and then you can just push along there. Um, sorry, I hope that gets you started, but definitely check out uh, SketchUp Campus or one of the tutorials for the Follow Me tool. Uh, if there's nothing else at the last minute, I wanna thank you all again for coming. Uh, and I want to hand you over to Kristen Odell. She's our retail and exhibit manager at North Bennett Street, who I haven't seen in far too long. Hi, Eli. <laughs> Kristen. I know, I miss seeing you around. <laughs> I know, you're actually at the school, so that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, everyone, thank you again, and have a thank great Thank you, Eli. Thank you for that presentation. You're welcome. All right. Hey, everyone. Um, we just want to thank you all for joining us. We just want to thank you all for being here with us all day. Um, uh, you can see the, the our day one and day two up on our YouTube channel and go to our website and check out the schedule for tomorrow, um, nbss.edu. I don't need to do the www. Um, and we hope to see you tomorrow. We have great programs um, the same time, 10 to 3. And thank you so much. And we'll see you then.